Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Today's uh, Wednesday, March 3rd. We have a hearing today on uh, 10 education bills. And if you check the website, you can see the order. Excuse me, uh, though admittedly, we may have to switch the order for a member or two who has uh, hearings in other committees or uh, a big meeting that a few people have at 3.30. For now, we're going to start with House Bill 1170 from Delegate Shalega. Uh, this bill has been assigned not just to the Ways and Means Committee, but as well to the Appropriations Committee. So we do have three members from the Appropriations Committee, or should be here, Delegate Forbes, Delegate Solomon, and uh, Delegate Novotny. Uh, so they too will be free to ask questions on this issue. So we will start first. Delegate Shalega, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Oh, you've muted yourself. I should have known that by now. <laughs> Thank you, Chairwoman. For the record, I'm Delegate Kathy Shalega. Today I'm presenting House Bill 1170, Primary and Secondary Education, Virtual Schools. I'll make a few brief comments. You have my a testimony in your file, and then I'd like to turn the remainder of my time over to Mickey Ravenaugh. So students across Maryland have been relegated to virtual learning for more than 11 months now. Teachers and administrators for the most part have struggled to deliver a quality education virtually. While many students do not prefer virtual learning, there are some students and families that are truly thriving under this system of learning. Maryland's virtual schooling is tr a traditional model of teaching that's delivered virtually. Traditional education in a classroom was not designed and developed to be delivered virtually. So I'd like you to not think of virtual learning as what you've seen delivered over the last 11 months. So um, full-time virtual education programs are designed and built to be used online. The teachers, staff, and administrators are trained to deliver education online. Virtual education can be dynamic and effective for teaching students of all ages, especially when designed for this method. The ability to reach students in a home and hospital program effectively through online learning is exceptional. The possibilities for special needs students are also phenomenal. Today, I have a number of people here with the bill from Pearson Education. They're located right here in Columbia, Maryland. Their headquarters is here. They offer full-time virtual learning programs in 29 states. They've been delivering virtual schooling for 20 years, including wraparound services. Stride Learning is another company that also does online. They're gonna be submitting testimony. They got to me a little bit late. They're in 34 states. So it's time for Maryland to offer this public school option. This is not a charter school. It's a public school option for virtual learning. And with that, I'd like to turn the remainder of my time over to Mickey Rabinaugh. Thank right. you. Well, we don't, uh, Ms. Rabinaugh, hey. um, Ilya Shalega. Yes. Uh, that's not how we do it here. Oh, uh, okay. Well, then I'd like to turn the next comments over to Mickey Ravenna. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have her go next. Um, I, I do have, uh, just want to give uh, members an opportunity to ask Delegate Shalega some questions. And so I just, uh, just uh, simply, um, uh, you're just saying that this is something that would be uh, a choice within a given family. If they believe that um, either the educational needs or like you said, hospital or anything else um, necessitates it for either a period of time or long term. Is that correct? Yeah, this this is, is simply enabling, and it is for public schools. It is not a charter school. And um, no, I'm not. I'm not assuming it's a charter school. I'm just trying to ask. Are, I, I, I'm really not asking what you think I'm asking. I'm just simply asking. A parent is just making a decision in a given case if they want their child to learn this way. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Some okay. kids love it, and and others do not. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Are any other questions for the delegate? Uh, if not, I will go to uh, Mickey Revenal. Thank you. All right, go ahead. All right. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, members of the Ways and Means Committee, um, Delegate Shalega and others. 
Um, uh, we're here to testify on behalf of this bill. Um, I'm Mickey Rubin. I'm actually one of the co-founders of Connections Academy, uh, which is a leading provider of uh, high quality K-12 online learning. Uh, that's based here in Maryland, as Delegate Shalaya said, um, and is currently serving over 100,000 students um, in uh, 28 states around the United States and around the world as well. Um, based on my experience over the past two decades in bringing personalized performance learning opportunities to students elsewhere throughout, uh, through outstanding virtual public schools, I'm really honored to explore with you how to finally make the same opportunity available to students here in Maryland. Um, that's why we are here to highly support um, HB 1170 um, and encourage its passage out of this committee. Um, so when my co-founders and I first started working on this Connections Academy idea in Baltimore's Inner Harbor back in 2001, right in the wake of 9-11, um, we were responding to an emerging desire by American families for public school options that fit the needs of their kids. 20 years ago, what's blindingly obvious to all of us now um, was just becoming clear that technology could allow the idea of a school as a place one size fits all to be transformed into anytime, anywhere, personalized learning um, for students. No more would the accident of one's zip code determine the quality of your child's learning. Uh, no more would bricks and bells limit the where and when of learning. No more would the aspiring Olympian um, or the budding Broadway star have to make that heartbreaking choice between a life's passion um, and an excellent public school education. What we didn't know then and what we do know now is how essential this online learning opportunity would be to thousands of especially vulnerable students, the bullied, um, the struggling, the ill all over America. In state after state, what we saw is parents seeking a better fit for their child coming together to create a Connections Academy of their own. And they were always thrilled to see that in fact, an online school could bring the very best teachers, the richest curriculum, the warmest friendships and relationships right into their own home. Recent research such as the independent study connected on our Connections Academy schools, in fact, shows there's no statistical difference in the performance of students in virtual schools on state math and reading tests between brick and mortar and virtual schools when matched for student mobility and other kinds of demographic data. So when COVID hit a year ago, um, Connections Academy students kept right on learning without a hitch. They in fact um, reached out to their friends and neighbors who suddenly found themselves doing what we would call emergency remote schooling, what we've all experienced over the last year um, to help them through what that experience would be like. And uh, tens of thousands of them, when they saw the structure and support that was available through a purpose-built online school, made the switch um, to um, Connections Academy schools across the country, uh, swelling our enrollments by about 40% over the last year. Um, and what they're experiencing now, students in these Connections Academy schools, is actually a really consistent school experience with carefully designed academics, really well thought out extracurricular activities, and perhaps most importantly, a smart and sustainable role for parents as learning coaches. Everywhere around the country, but not uh, in Maryland. Ms. Revenal, your, uh, your, your time, I, I, I was looking down and missed it. Your time was up. You have one more sentence. Okay. Bill? Um, uh, so uh, we call upon you to help change that and bring this opportunity to families here in Maryland. Um, please, um, on behalf of the students that we serve and ourselves, we recommend a favorable committee report on HB 1170. And I thank you All so right. much for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, to members, we have, I'm gonna take uh, another three people, then questions, another group of four and then questions, and then the one person opposed. So uh, hold up. Uh, the next person we have is Amy Sparks. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and distinguished delegates. My name is Amy Sparks and I'm a resident of Rosedale, Maryland. I'm here today to support House Bill 1170 in support of virtual schools alteration. 17 years ago, I had to pull my children out of the public school system due to bullying and forced to homeschool. I was worried about my ability to teach them high school, but then in ninth grade, we participated in the Baltimore County online pilot program. Even though success, it was canceled due to Maryland laws. We chose to continue in the private Pearson Online Academy. This was the best experience for us. For instance, my one daughter had ADHD. She was behind in reading. Through extra reading classes, she was back on grade level. My husband worked 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. Them being online allowed him to be active in their lives and education. 
Both my daughters graduated and received senatorial and marine scholarships. I'm very proud of my daughter's achievements. For example, my one daughter works for John Hopkins Hospital and helped install the new Skip Guide Buildings wireless network. This brings me great pride as I'm a breast cancer warrior and I received my follow-up care in that exact building. When I was diagnosed, my younger two were in elementary school. I thought I might need to pull, pull them out and put them into a brick and mortar school, scared of what I would be able to handle. My son's teacher said, we got you. They ensured us that my children stayed on track through their live lessons, live tutoring, and gave us the needed flexibility to continue. My son is now a senior. His entire education has been virtual school. 13 years with Pearson's. 13, he started in kindergarten. I remember when he was taking calculus, he jokingly asked me for help. I said, sure. Took over his mouse and clicked the school's live tutor button. Now with his computer knowledge, he is currently taking outside Cisco and cybersecurity classes. Today, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Maryland students have been thrown into what I would call crisis online learning mode. In my view, this is not quality virtual school. With my daughter's Sam, now in the ninth grade, gratefully, our biggest struggle this last year has been reminding her friends that she's not off school, she has to do class. Remember the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. This holds true for virtual school. Maryland teachers are doing their best, but quality programs have spent over 20 years developing and evolving. I know because we have grown with them. I don't mind telling my age. <laughs> it is your job to look ahead to prepare Maryland because families need this option. I plead with you to vote to approve House Bill 1170. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sparks. Uh, we next have Michelle Klein. Good afternoon to the delegates of the House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Michelle Klein. Um, I am pleased to offer my full support for HB 1170. Similar legislation was passed by the South Carolina legislator in 2007. That statute led to the creation of South Carolina Connections Academy, a virtual public school where I am an educator. Over the past six years, I have worked with students and their families in a remote environment. My colleagues and I have collaborated as a team to support our mission of learning for all. This collaborative culture helped our students thrive, but also created a family of administrators, teachers, and counselors that work to meet the individual needs of our students. I am in inspired by my colleagues and you know, quite frankly, motivated by my students who succeed sometimes even when faced with the most adverse circumstances. Learners at our school are able to work at their own pace, attend synchronous li uh, live lessons and participate in virtual events and face-to-face -face learning experiences. All students learn differently and SCCA's personalized approach is a great option for our diverse population throughout the state. Although traditional public schools and virtual schools are different in the way learning is structured, all schools are dedicated to ensuring students graduate from high school and become productive members of our society. I am so proud to be an educator on that team. And I ask you to support uh, HB 1170, because I truly believe that Maryland parents and students uh, will greatly benefit from having this high quality option for their children. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Uh, next, we have Jane St. Pierre. Madam Chair, distinguished delegates, thank you for allowing me to address this uh, distinguished body. I am Jane St. Pierre. Um, I am a Louisiana teacher in both public and private schools uh, for more than two decades. And um, also very proud to have been a learning coach for my two sons who both earned high school diplomas from a private online high school based out of Maryland. Um, it was called International Connections Academy at the time. Um, and the name has changed to Pearson Online Learning since they graduated. 
Throughout my career, I have observed many students not flourishing in the traditional brick and mortar setting, even despite the accommodations that have been given to them. And the unfortunate truth is that oftentimes the educational system unintentionally abandons those who do not thrive in the set format that's provided simply by a failure to expand varied alternatives. We have to intentionally provide options that meet different learning styles and different needs of students. If in fact, the ultimate goal is a pathway to success for all. A case in point, um, one of my sons, Joey, um, I gave you a detailed letter about his triumphs and tribulations during his academic journey. Um, when he was enrolled in this online high school, he went from requesting to drop out in 10th grade to absolutely soaring. He became a phenomenal student. He learned how to research and find answers to things and actually shocked himself to find out that he in fact was a learner. We are ever so grateful for the opportunity. Um, I had my second son also attend the same high school. Um, my oldest one is now 23 years old and he is the youngest manager in the history of the district of his company. And we completely credit this online high school with just giving him the confidence and the ability to do what he needs to do to be a productive member of society. Um, since he graduated, it has been my mission to expand opportunities for students in my beloved state of Louisiana and anywhere that people will listen to me. Um, I encourage parents to always look outside the box when a system is not fitting their child. Um, we need to support our children. We need to give them as many options as necessary um, to get all students past the hurdle of a high school diploma and flourishing in society. Therefore, I implore you to provide a free public option for a quality virtual school in your state. Hope that my state continues to do the same thing too. Um, and I really thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. Thank you uh, to uh, the, the four who just spoke. We do have uh, uh, five hands up, so we'll start in order. Uh, Delegate Ebersole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'm sorry, this might be for the sponsor. <clears throat> I'm noting that, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm noting that, it, that in the bill, we have a certain exemptions uh, that the schools would have to meet. Uh, some of them are curricular, some of them are attendance. Um, I'm, I'm wondering now, it says they're a member of the regular school system. I'm curious what how those were selected. And does this select out anything else or are the course requirements and testing requirements that the state has for students to graduate from high school would they still be in place in these schools or would they not? Um, so the actual, this is enabling and the counties or Baltimore City or the Maryland St uh, State Department of Education is tasked with adopting an online virtual, full-time online virtual schooling. So within that agreement, they can make some of those um, requirements. You know, I, I see it as putting an RFP out and looking for a, a company that already does this and then looking at the benchmarks. I'm sure they'd be happy to put some of those requirements in, but obviously virtual uh, online schooling is not a, the bell rings at 8 a.m. You know, that's where you show up, you finish. You, you heard that from Mrs. Sparks and you know, Mrs. Klein. So it's it's a less traditional model. And so we had to exclude those things to, to be able to have enabling legislation to let a county in, engage in a contract with a company that does this. But will this bill enable them to also still, uh, for example, only require two math credits for graduation rather than three? Or, or in other words, that's not in your bill, but are you, is it, could that be part of the RFP or? Uh, well, it would be up to the county. So the, so the county that, that creates that system can leave those requirements in place. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I could refer to Mickey to let me know how it works in other states. I'm sure, you know, the, the 33 other states they're in have requirements that they have to meet. 
And generally speaking, um, these schools comply with all of the curriculum requirements that the state typically has in place, all of the assessment requirements, the special education requirements, everything that makes a public school a public school within the state, with the ability in this instance for whoever the sponsoring uh, district um, or the state department ed, or even potentially a higher education institution, um, to do some slight tailoring to really accommodate the fact that it's uh, virtual and not in person. But we're not looking to exclude them from any of the requirements the state has in place, as you mentioned, assessments and, and that type of thing. It's just that you're not looking to, but the, with the bill, do you feel the bill would allow them to exclude them if they wanted to? Well, the county wouldn't let that happen. I mean, well, you, the county doesn't make those decisions. Okay. It's a state uh, decision. All yeah. right. Um, I think um, we're going to okay. go. The, the next question, I, I think the point was made and uh, certainly the, the subcommittee takes this up. They can look at amendments that could address that point. Next person uh, with their hand up is Delegate Hornberger. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And this is for the bill sponsor or, or Mickey, you seem to be a subject matter expert here. But um, so a lot of school jurisdictions obviously were forced into doing this over, over COVID, um, some with varying degrees of success. So now as students start to migrate back into the classrooms, uh, ho hopefully uh, more as soon as possible, why is this bill sort of still necessary? And then and how is it gonna impact the teacher versus the student if the bill passes? Uh, so I, you know, this bill would allow those students that are really thriving in a, in a virtual schooling environment to be able to do that next year, or I, I don't know if we could get it done that quickly. I'd say the year after it, will, it won't won't happen by the fall. But you know, any county that adopts this kind of on, public online full time virtual program would be able to serve kids that really are thriving in this environment. And you know, look, COVID's been terrible in so many ways. But one way that we can see some positive things is that we now know some students actually really thrive in this environment. And, you know, learning styles are um, so important that we recognize that. So I think, you know, this would allow that to continue happening for the students and families across our state. And one of the things that we've definitely seen that's been made this emergency remote schooling so challenging um, for schools and for and for teachers and for students is the lack of a really structured program um, that uh, that really supports the role of the teacher and supports the role of the parent in a way that is designed from scratch um, to happen. And so these virtual schools sort of um, uh, you know kind of flip on its head the challenges. Of, of the emergency schooling that we've seen and really um, create from scratch the supports that would allow teachers to um, uh, you know, teach to their highest abilities, students to have access to materials um, that support them um, off of Zoom calls um, and a really structured extracurricular um, and supportive environment so that they're not missing those pieces of what makes school school um, because these schools are schools. Thank you. All right, thank you, Delegate. Uh, next, we have Delegate April Rose. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, Kevin asked all my questions and beyond. Um, so I, I think between Delegates Schlega and Mickey Ravenal, I think you covered what I needed to know. Thank you. Well, Delegate Hornberger, two gold stars for you. Uh, Delegate Jones with a question. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Ms. Ravenal, my my question is for you, please. Um, you stated in your testimony that recent research, uh, such as the independent study uh, conducted on Connections Academy shows there's no statistical difference in performance on state math and reading tests between brick and mortar and virtual schools. Um, that's what you said, right? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. And, and what, what research was that? I'd love to see that. Um, we'd be really happy to provide you with the research. It was actually um, so validated. send that to the entire 
Send that to the committee staff and they will share that with everyone on the committee. Right. Um, but uh, the important piece is it was externally validated um, by education researchers as well as a uh, consulting firm, basically looking at um, you know, uh, controlling for mobility and other student demographics that in state after state, actually, there was no statistical difference in terms of students' performance on these state tests, which are a really critical and important measure of how students are doing. So we'd be really happy to provide that to the whole committee. Wow, no difference between virtual and, okay, and, and brick and mortar. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing that. That's that's very helpful and reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Delegate Guyton. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you for presenting this bill and for answering our questions so succinctly. Um, I'm also very interested in that data. It's not exactly consistent with some other data that I've seen in the past. So I, I know there are different ways of doing research and different ways of funding it. So I would like more information about that. Um, I think that you all have done a really good job presenting a strong argument for the possibility that virtual schooling you know, may be a good option for some of our students, not all of our students, but some of the, our students. But I do have concerns that there are a lot of things that you get in a classroom setting that you cannot get on a virtual setting. So um, I believe, and I just wanted to double check, county boards can currently, I mean, you can currently set up a virtual school in the state of Maryland. Is that correct? You can offer virtual courses. Uh, we can't really so do, do a virtual school. Do we not have a school. charter school, a, a virtual charter school in Maryland? You do not. Okay. All right. I thought that there was one in Columbia. So I apologize. I might have had the wrong information on that. Um, but it sounds like what this bill wants to do is ask the state board or county boards, um, it was unclear in Delegate Zaliga's statement, to provide uh, guidelines and regulations, but the state superintendent does not have the authorization to actually approve these schools. And they also are, the way I read the bill, consistent with how Delegate Eversall reads the bill, it seems that they are exempt from a lot of the regulations that other schools um, do have to abide with in the public school system here. So. Um, there are a lot of questions here. I'm not saying that this isn't something that we need to, to really look at carefully, but um, I'd like to see more of what that structure would actually look like. And I would also want any public school in Maryland to be under the same jurisdictional oversight as the other public schools in Maryland. And I don't believe that's how this bill is written. Um, I think that the intention is that um, there would be exemption from certain face-to-face -face requirements while complying with curriculum, assessment, special education accommodations and others. Mm -hmm. So that's the intention. I, um, if there's some clarification needed there, that was never the intention to escape from uh, anything that really makes a public school a public school. Um, and all of those things are critically important because that's what creates an equitable playing field across the state. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you both. And uh, one last question, we have uh, Delegate Long. You're muted, Delegate Long. Thank you, Delegate Schlega. Delegate Long, I'm mute, yes. Thank you, thank you, Delegate Schlega, for bringing this good bill. Um, I actually have a bill, something similar to it. We had talked about doing the intern. Um, we have to look at some of the positive things that this could possibly do. Uh, would help uh, overcrowding in some of our schools that we have a real issue with. Uh, would, you, would you think that this would help that? Overcrowding? I certainly think it would help that. And um, again, I mentioned home and hospital. This would be a terrific program for home and hospital. Um, someone mentioned to me, could this be used um, with our juveniles that are um, in, in detention centers? And I said, I, I hadn't thought of it, but I don't know why it couldn't. But this is a flexible program. And, um, you know, I think it could certainly be a great public school option. Right. Um, my, my second question is, is for anyone, uh, do you know if any of these virtual schools now are actually recording their classes while they're going on so a student could go back and review that, uh, you know, that class, if they're having a problem, you know, a lot of kids need Every that single one extra. of them. Every single one of them. And uh, the teacher that's with us will probably um, validate exactly what you're pointing out, which is that having the recorded version of that live session is a huge resource for the students. Um, so mm -hmm. absolutely, that, that becomes something that um, endures beyond the end of the class session um, and becomes an incredible resource um, for students who want to go back and review. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you all very much. Seeing no other questions, I'm... Uh, 
turning the reins over to Delegate Ebersol for a few minutes. I will be back in a few minutes. Thank you, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, next we'll have Akindele Omotosho to uh, testify, please. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Akindele Omotosho. I am a freshman at Pearson Online Academy. And prior to attending Pearson Online Academy, I was homeschooled since I was in third grade. My experience with Pearson Online Academy has been wonderful so far. I think that it is incredible how interactive each teacher is in the classes and how they make the work interesting for people to learn. I also like being able to attend clubs at the school. Like I attend diversity club where we talk about important topics on our world. Uh, in my opinion, I think Pearson Online Academy is a great school. I have met several different people and I've truly had a great experience. I love the flexible time schedules and classes. Now each class is recorded so I can always watch them later. And I also enjoy having a flexible schedule because I actually own my own business and having flexible schedule lets me work on my business and work in school. Uh, I'm thankful that I could get into the Freedom Empowerment Scholarship, which helps me get free tuition for the school and lets me help uh, the city of Maryland because the scholarship, the only way I can progress in the scholarship is for me doing something to help say Malin, which I've decided to actually make masks with positive message to feed, help, feed, help, help give money to food banks in Malin so we can, they can help feed the poor. So I like working and helping feeding homeless people and giving people more opportunities. So I just love being in online school and I also hope that you support and enact HB 1170 so other people can have, other youth can have this experience to be in online schools. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll go to one more person and then we'll take a couple questions. Is Christy Jackson here to testify, please? Yes, I am. Thank you. Good please afternoon, continue. everyone. My name is Christy Jackson and I am here in favor of HB 1170. Uh, a lot of the testimony that you heard today is very much in line with what I would repeat, um, but I won't spare, I will spare you the expense of hearing that all over again. However, I am here to talk on behalf of students with uh, disabilities. Um, those students include students with IEPs, students with 504 plans, uh, our English language learners, and also students with illnesses and students that have suffered from trauma. Over my 19 years of experience as a special educator, I have been privileged to work with students of all walks of life, but mostly students with disabilities. I have watched students try to fit into the public uh, brick and mortar traditional uh, school system, which works for most students. However, over my years, I can think of so many students who would have benefited from an online virtual uh, school option had it been available to them. Those students now are probably flourishing and doing well in life. However, there are a lot of students right now that are in our public schools that will benefit from this option. We have families who would like to have a flexible option for say for instance, doctor's appointments. A lot of our students who are ill have a lot, a lot of doctor's appointments that they need to attend without having to worry about missing classes. They can actually be able to schedule around their classes there are flexible options for, for families to travel if they have a student that needs to travel out of state for any reason or out of the, the, uh, the city for any reason without having to miss any of their educational opportunities. But most importantly, families are now more uh, uh, able and available to be involved in their students' education. Over the years, as a uh, now that I'm with Pearson, I've worked with a lot of families in our Connections Academy school. And I hear them talk about how they have been able to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations with teachers more so now than they have ever been able to. The teachers are able to securely email and communicate with their parents at any time. They're able to call, they're able to, uh, in our what we call our live lesson sessions, which is our platform for, uh, for delivering education. They're able, the parents are able to sit directly next to their student while they're accessing their education, which is a, an opportunity unlike no other. 
So I implore you today to afford our families in Maryland the opportunity to be involved in their students' education so that this can be an option that they don't have to worry about making sure that their, their child fits into a, a traditional model and they can benefit from a more uh, virtual online education. Thank you. And thank you very much. We have a few more favorables, so I think we'll let them uh, testify and then we'll see if there are questions. Uh, Catherine Carter, are you here? Hi, members of Ways and Means. Um, my name is Catherine Carter. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Sorry, I'm in the car hiding from my five kids. <laughs> so, um, I live in District 9 and writing in support of this bill. Um, my oldest, uh, Atticus, is still in Howard County's version of virtual school. Yet I actually am pulled out my kids and homeschooling for my kids with online programs that I sign as a virtual teacher. Um, this bill will help ensure that schools can offer students who struggle in, in school but thrive in virtual environmental environment equal access to an educational environment that works best for them. Um, a lot of kids are thriving in virtual school. Four of mine did not, but Atticus is. Um, he's e easily able to find his assignments, he likes it better, and he's becoming a more independent learner and doing better than traditional. Um, I also think that this bill can really help with the home and hospital aspect. Um, I wish it had been a, an option, virtual school had been an option when Atticus was in hospital, home and hospital. In sixth grade year, Atticus was diagnosed with double vision. At the beginning of the year, the IEP team denied him any vision accommodation, saying double vision was not a visual impairment. And throughout the year, he struggled with his um, headaches, nausea, and dizziness that got worse. And after developing um, vertigo, was not able to read beyond 15 minutes. And I pulled him out of school and put him in home and hospital. Students typically receive only six instructional hours a week on a full-time home and hospital. And we actually had to purchase audiobooks and computers with our own money to provide Atticus with needed vision accommodations um, through the digital technology and Atticus, even though he was recovering physically, he was losing significant um, instruction time, with just six hours of instruction per week. In addition, home and hospital is extremely difficult for working parents, especially since it requires adult supervision outside of the teacher. I had a friend whose daughter could not return to school um, due to TBI, visual and behavioral health issues for years. She was a working parent who for years had to use family and friends to provide adult supervision or transportation for her daughter to the local library. It was a real struggle for my friend and the family and greatly impacted the daughter's academics. She is now doing online college and thriving, but she lost a lot of learning and it has had to make up for that. Um, the virtual school option would have made a significant difference in her life. Also, alternative schools will live in Western Howard County. And, uh, you know, my son's friends, they get picked up early and they get dropped off late. If virtual school was an option for them, they would have more time to actually learn and be a kid. Um, in addition, it's better um, digital accessibility for disabilities. Um, I am finding between what I'm assigning virtually and then what my son is getting, that my children, three of them require digital accommodations and um, are getting those accommodations, are getting Pardon abilities. Pardon me, Ms. Carter. I, you okay. probably are on a phone, so you probably don't have a good look at the clock, but your, your no, time's I can't up. It at all. So I just wanted to encourage you guys to look, consider this bill. It's not for everyone, but there are a lot of gaps that this actually could address. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Olivia Crudup. Are you there? I am, thank you so much. Um, okay, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Olivia Crudup and I'm from Harford County, Maryland. I wanna say first, I greatly appreciate the platform to show my support for HB 1170. I'm currently a stay-at-home mom. My husband is currently laid off due to COVID-19 and I have two young daughters who will be turning two and four in the next few months. My husband and youngest daughter have had many health issues and for my youngest, she's unfortunately had a few scares since the pandemic has started. Um, a friend of mine, knowing our circumstances, referred us to Pearson's Online Academy, a full-time virtual private school, as an option for my daughter who will be starting kindergarten in the 21 to 22 school year. I listened to my friend's experience and saw how her four children thrived in virtual schooling. Now all of them have a college education are meeting, and are meeting their goals. 
their experience and my own research have helped me to come to the understanding that this is the best option for my children's education. This program is thorough and inclusive of the values that I choose to raise my children with. My daughter has had a class and many different social activities online regularly and has really enjoyed this experience. I believe it has really opened her imagination. However, she will not have an option for online public school for kindergarten this fall. We aren't able to afford the virtual private school for her. The health risk of our family associated with attending school in person is very concerning. If HB 1170 is approved, my daughter will have a whole new world of education open to her to thrive with the necessary building blocks of education. The teachers are trained in virtual education and will ensure she has a personalized learning experience. And in a quality public um, virtual school, she will also develop her social skills in the community. Please pass this HB 1170 bill. This will be dramatically beneficial for all the children who do not have the option to attend in-person school and gives families like ours the opportunity to provide the best option of learning for their children within our financial means. Thank you again for giving me this platform to express my support for the HB 1170 bill. Thank you very much for your testimony. That's for, do we have, are there any questions for uh, these uh, witnesses? Okay, seeing none, we move to an unfavorable uh, witness and that would, our first would be uh, Diana Bergman. Are you here? I'm here. Um, hi, hi, everybody. Um, so today I'm requesting an unfavorable report for House Bill 1170. And the reason for this is because I found the language of this legislation denying access to virtual education for students. Um, the legislation clearly states prohibiting a virtual school from enrolling a certain number of certain students and from charging fees and tuition, but it fails to identify and describe the definition of what those certain students are. So another thing that this bill also reminds me about was um, a debate that happened on the House delegation floor regarding the 188 be safe number that we use to report bullying that we already had. And right now I see that um, academic options for virtual instruction is currently available. In Baltimore County, we have what we call our academic program choices for family where we give them choices and they could practice in e-learning. E-learning is Baltimore County's form of providing virtual instruction. And we also have homeschooling. It's another academic option. We also have the home and hospital program that targets very specifically different supports on how to access instruction. So I'm really, really concerned that we're requesting to have legislation with no state oversight of recommendations for education instruction uh, for something that is currently available if a parent chooses to participate in that program. They would enroll their child in homeschooling and then have the flexibility to use whatever program they desire for homeschool. Um, I just don't, don't understand um, how we could have state dollars with no oversight. And each one of these academic options that we have in Baltimore County schools are specifically designed to help students that learn differently. You know, our home and hospital students for emotional condition, they do need access to that in-person interaction to be emotionally available to transition back to traditional school. Our e-learning program allows students to participate in an actual hybrid approach. Way before even COVID happened, students are able to log into their e-learning classes and then switch over to a regular class like um, PE or something and then come back to their e-learning. We've been doing this prior to COVID. So I really request the committee for an unfavorable report because I think we're already doing this and we've been doing a really good job as a school system, providing these multiple choices and options for students in Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, uh, that, are there any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, uh, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1170. And uh, I see that Madam Chair is back in the room, so I'm gonna uh, ask her to announce the next bill. Yeah, I've been back for a little while, Delegate Abersole, watching you. 
Um, Delegate Smith, next bill, House Bill 1307. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, I'm Delegate Stephanie Smith, and I'm here introducing House Bill 1307, and I hope to receive a favorable report. So what this bill does is it addresses necessary changes to our child care licensing requirements. By creating a clear exemption and registration category, the Maryland State Department of Education will have more information and authority over these programs than they currently do. Um, the exemption is clear. It applies only to youth organizations with significant experience running these programs with rigorous health, safety, and education requirements, and youth organizations with direct local government oversight. The organizations that would qualify for the exemption must have existing requirements to ensure the safety of children they care for, including annual background checks for all employees, board members, et cetera, and also establish safety policies for compliance with mandated reporting statutes and regulations. And lastly, they must maintain proper staffing for um, staffing to youth ratios and ensure that the health and safety of, of youth and staff are experienced at all times. And the reason why I'm bringing um, this bill up is that um, many of you know that I am a proponent of thoughtful health protective um, regulations. It's something I've, I've, I've worked on in other aspects of my life. And I think there is um, oftentimes things that we um, are negotiating as a body about what level of regulation is appropriate, necessary, or, or helpful. Um, I brought forth House Bill 1307 as an emergency measure because there is a mismatch in what the current um, regulatory landscape is seeking to address. So current child care licensing requirements are focused on early childhood safety. I'm a mother of a two-year-old and many of you who have kids understand that really, really small children, um, the licensing that contemplated um, their care is very focused on things related to supporting breastfed infants and other general care that's related to small children. Um, that, isn't necessarily um, the type of um, service that someone um, focusing on a program that um, supports six-year-olds and up would necessarily need to have um, compliance with as um, an appropriate um, form of regulatory expectations. Um, currently, MSDE wants two years of hiring approval for existing programs, some of which have been in operation for 50 years. We're talking about experienced um, um, child care entities that focus on um, children of, of higher ages. So um, this current mismatch of regulatory um, framework has staff to student ratio minimums that don't reflect the different types of programming, particularly for recreational and athletic programming with older students, um, physical plant requirements suited to toddlers and young children, not to growing youth and teens. And lastly, the programs um, that serve a mix of age groups would, are currently um, you know, put in situations where they may have to separate children over the age of 13 um, um, so a 12-year-old perhaps and a 13-year-old could not be engaged in the same activity, which would normally um, make sense because of the type of, um, a type of um, experience they're engaged in in, in the care of, of the program. So um, for these reasons, I, I seek your support for House Bill 1307 because it requires youth development organizations. It explicitly outlines the types of organizations that meet um, that standard, some of which are familiar to you by name, like a Boys and Girls Club or um, a YMCA, um, and programs to maintain liability insurance and to have certain criminal background check records, which would be required to be completed at intervals determined you know, on a regular basis. So. Um, um, this is not about um, putting our children in unsafe circumstances. It's about making sure that the regulatory framework that we create to support their safety and care is coherent with the activities that they're being um, subjected to in the ages of the children that are of um, concern. So with that, I urge you to favorably support House Bill 1307. Thank you, Delegate Smith. Uh, any questions for Delegate Smith? All right, thank you, Delegate. We do have uh, several people signed up. I'll take the first, uh, I guess, I'll probably take all five and then some questions uh, and then some unfavorable after that. We'll start with Ellie Mitchell. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Ellie Mitchell. I'm the director of the Maryland Out of School Time Network, and I want to thank Delegate Smith for her sponsorship. Now more than ever, we need safe spaces with caring adults for Maryland's young people. Um, School-age licensed childcare is a critical part of that solution, but more is needed. 
Uh, most would not support this bill if we thought it would harm school age programs. Um, the bill actually provides additional clarity and oversight that will ultimately benefit everyone. And we hope will spark a good faith effort to overhaul our school age licensing regulations. That too will improve the life for the providers who currently exert Herculean efforts to meet the current standards. A healthy youth-centered ecosystem supports a variety of delivery models. It's not about competition, it's about coordination. There are almost 1 million school-aged children in Maryland. 150,000 of them live in poverty. However, just 6,500 school-aged children in Maryland benefit from childcare subsidies monthly. Many families also don't qualify for subsidy and can't afford fee-for-service childcare programs. And this is one of the reasons Maryland is ranked in the 43rd in the country for access to out-of-school time programs. The trusted youth development organizations named in this bill provide low and no cost opportunities serving students that would otherwise not be served by childcare. So why not just license them, right? What's, that's the question. Unfortunately, the licensing regulations are a square peg for a round hole. School age childcare is specifically designed for six to 12 year olds, although we know in practice that actually skews much younger. Uh, youth development organizations tend to skew a bit older. Uh, as, as Delegate Smith mentioned, once a child is 13, 14, that's seventh, eighth grade, the rules say that those students need to be kept separate. That's an untenable program model for a boys and girls club. That is just one of the many regulations that keeps program from seeking and receiving childcare licenses. You're gonna hear from opponents that the proposed exemptions threaten safety. Most would not advocate for anything that puts young people at risk. The question is who gets to deem that program is safe? We are familiar with the national standards and local monitoring procedures of the organizations explicitly included in this le legislation. And these programs are being held accountable for safety and quality. MSDE should focus enforcement on programs that have no oversight. By requiring programs to register and provide safety affidavits, we will better understand where and who is uh, serving students, and that will allow a focus on keeping unaffiliated programs from operating in the shadows. Washington, D.C. and California, who are number one and two in the state for access to after school, both have several of these exemptions, as do 36 other states. Recognizing that one size does not fit all will more clearly delineate license and license exempt programs and increase access for young people. For these Ms. reasons, we urge a favorable report. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Michael McDonald. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Mike McDonald. I'm the Vice President of Impact and Innovation for the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington. Greater Washington organization operates four um, after school locations in Prince George's and Montgomery County. And my colleagues around the state operate 40 boys and girls clubs in addition to our virtual clubhouse. Boys and girls clubs have been an important resource for children across the state for at least 70 years. Thousands of kids, thousands of Marylanders are proud boys and girls club alumni, including Khalil Green, uh, who was the first African-American student body president at Yale University and a proud alumni of our Germantown Boys and Girls Club. In the face of the coronavirus public health emergency, Boys and Girls Club leapt into action to support our members and their families. We created Clubhouse at Your House, a safe virtual Boys and Girls Club experience that all of our members could access free of charge. We answered the call of MSDE to open two EPSA locations and other clubs across the state did the same. In fact, we opened and served children in Silver Spring through a brand new partnership with Holy Cross Hospital. And our second facility was at our Germantown Clubhouse. We were at the vanguard of creating COVID safe programming, but eventually the EPSA program came to an end. Many of our parents are essential workers and were called to return back to work. So we offered a program for our members to be in a safe, space, um, have access to high-speed internet, um, eat a healthy meal, and engage in really great creative programming at our Germantown Club. And that's a program that essentially we've been running for the last 70 years. Much to our surprise, we received a cease and desist letter from the Maryland State Department of Education. Currently, we are in process to try and complete the licensing um, procedure 
though as we go through it, we continue to realize that it's not a great fit. Everything from physical plant requirements to the types of training required to our staff and uh, training that's better suited to programming that's uh, addressed towards infant and toddlers. But we have embarked on this process because if we don't, we won't be able to continue to support our families. Put simply, the MSDE childcare regulations were not designed with out of school time programs in mind. Meeting MSDE childcare regulations will not enhance the safety of the children we serve now and we have served for decades and will needlessly complicate our ability to meet our mission to serve children between the ages of six and 18 who need us most. I thank you very much for your attention today and uh, urge you, encourage you to think positively of this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll next uh, hear from Moira Cyphers. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington and members of the committee. I'm Maura Cyphers with Compass Government Relations and I'm here on behalf of my client, um, the Maryland Alliance of Boys and Girls Clubs. You just heard from Mike um, and really we're here as a last resort. We need your help to keep our doors open so kids have a safe place to go and so parents can go to work. Um, we're here because if MSDE succeeds in shutting down these programs, MSDE, our state education authority will be directly responsible to the harm that comes to kids and the achievement gap that will become an unbridgeable gulf. Um, there's a BGC saying that I love, which is when school is out, clubs are in. Um, and in this case, schools closed all the time and the kids in the clubs and the Ys and the LMB and the county rec and park programs have nowhere else to go. Um, the organizations before you, they're not childcare providers. As youth clubs, they've always operated under that exemption in the law. And this bill gives trusted and safe community partners the certainty that they can keep serving their kids and families and MSD more oversight than they have today. Um, we've long known that our current regulatory structure is unsustainable, but really to pull the rug out and to say, you know, staff of 20 years, you need to do the zero to five training, even though your club kids are in elementary school or you need to install tiny toilets in the building you don't own. And hey, we want you to run anyone you wanna hire by us for two years um, during a pandemic especially is, is heartless. And you know we're here with a bill because we have spent the last few months going back and forth with MSDE. Um, and we've said, you know, use us as a model of how to transition back safely. Can our summer camp licenses qualify under some of the existing executive orders through the Maryland Department of Health? Can we get an executive order? Um, do anything to help us, help us keep these Zoom schools open. I mean, this is what these kids and communities need and what is shutting us down do? Um, it really, it puts pressure, unbearable pressure on the families and kids who deserve our support the most. So I think when considering this bill, we respectfully request that you center the needs of the people who will really be served by it, which are the kids. And you know what they need most right now is reliable internet access for Zoom school and social support and fun things to do like a STEM lab or a podcast studio or running around a gym with friends. Um, we are all in this together. I think we've heard that for a year now, but really we ask for your support to make sure that these kids and families continue to have the support they need as, as schools figure out the reopening. Thank you. Thank you so much. We next have Pamela Brown. Good afternoon, delegates. Pam Brown on behalf of the Association of the Local Management Boards supporting this bill and our partners like the Boys and Girls Club across the state. I think there's, there's a real equity issue here. I have personal experience of it. Here in Anne Arundel County, a group of us met together at the beginning of the pandemic. I know Delegate Jones was part of those meetings, really to look at what was happening to the children who were already falling into the achievement gap and understanding that many of them did not have equivalent access to virtual schooling. In our county, we set up with actually, she's a, one of our most respected providers in the county, a virtual school along with three other churches. And we're also given a cease and desist order. That made absolutely no sense to me in the middle of a pandemic, that, there was, that we did not have any partnership there to really talk about what mattered. 
which was what was happening to our most vulnerable children at that time. And so we, we highly support looking at this, partnering with the MSDE to really be flexible in how we deal with our children when things are already going wrong and, and creating inequity. So you've got my written testimony. I don't need to say it. I, I urge you to really think very seriously about this bill. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Brown. And then we uh, last uh, on the favorables, we have uh, Drew Jabin. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Drew Jabin on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties here in support of House Bill 1307. We really appreciate the delegate for introducing this wonderful bill. You do have my written testimony. I will be brief. Just want to make a couple points. As the pandemic continues to impact families all across the state, access to affordable, safe childcare opportunities is so important. House Bill 1307 would provide a narrow, reasonable exception to current regulations in order to allow for certain organizations and departments to provide these out of school services. Counties and nonprofits have been requesting this exception for almost a year now. They have just been asking to be able to provide the necessary service expansions during the state of emergency. So this bill would allow for county parks and rec programs, as well as programs funded and monitored by local management boards to be exempt from the definition of a child care center, therefore allowing them more flexibility to provide these services. All counties truly prioritize providing for the health and well-being of children in their communities. Again, this bill is a simple, reasonable ex exemption to allow for county programs to provide um, service for more Maryland families who are in desperate need of trusted, safe child care. And according, accordingly, MAKO requests a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Javen. Um, to members, any question for the uh, five who just spoke in favor of the legislation? All right, uh, thank you all who, uh, who testified. I'm gonna move on uh, to the next two names on the list. We have Clinton McSherry. Madam Chair, honorable members, good afternoon. My name is Clinton McSherry and I'm the Director of Public Policy at Maryland Family Network, a statewide nonprofit focused on childcare. Uh, I thank you for this opportunity to speak today in opposition to this legislation, although I truly wish that were not the case. If we were instead having a conversation about the need to review and revise the regulations in COMAR that pertain to school-age childcare, Maryland Family Network would be an enthusiastic supporter. But as it stands, this legislation would put into statute sweeping and I would argue potentially dangerous exemptions to critical safeguards designed to protect children who are cared for outside their homes. Regulations may often seem like a nuisance or worse, but they generally exist for a reason. When we're talking about childcare for children of any age, many of these reasons focus on the need to ensure health and safety. That applies both to the fitness of the adults providing the care and the facilities and programs through which the care is provided. Lots of considerations need to be taken into account. Not just one, but multiple background checks. Foundational training in child development at different ages and stages proper facilities for the type of care being, being provided, operational policies and practices for both routine and emergency situations. And that's just touching on a few of the elements. Licensing and regulation give us as a state the means to ensure as best we can that health, safety, and developmental needs are being taken into, into account. Uh, I, I know some proponents here will argue that some of the groups exempted here are members of national organizations with their own standards for affiliation. And to that, I just wanna make two points. First, whatever those affiliate standards may be, the state of Maryland has no significant ability to set, monitor, or enforce them. Second, the bill carves out overly broad exemptions for other prospective childcare pro programs that may have no such affiliation or in fact, any operating standards at all. Again, Maryland Family Network would welcome a review of existing school egg regs, um, but this bill instead proposes a wholesale elimination of regs for far too many prospective providers. And sadly, we've seen horrific examples around the country of what can result from un unregulated or underregulated programs. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and, and urge you to reject House Bill 1307. Thank you, Mr. McSherry. Uh, Christina Push. Can 
here. Uh, I'm not seeing her in the moment. We will, uh, staff will double check the uh, waiting room. Uh, Mr. McSherry, let me ask a question for you. I, I appreciate all the concerns you mentioned and uh, all the different regulations. And I would ask um, if, if this bill were tailored in such a way that it was only for these uh, types of emergencies where there are pandemics and hopefully nothing else in the future, but something like this, uh, where a lot of these um, local affiliates of these national organizations were helping out. Um, do you see a pathway to get us there with a certain set of regulations that would continue to allow these school-age children who are not attending your, your centers, but uh, to support school-age children and supporting their parents being able to go back to work? Do you, do you see a pathway that we could set some other rules here without um, gutting all the regulations or but not making it impossible either? Yeah, so thank you for the question, Madam Chair. And I will tell you that, you know, in August and even late July, many of us who focus on this field were concerned because we knew schools were not going to open as usual in September. So a lot of us would argue that MSDE needs to be more flexible. And you'll hear that, I think, from a whole array of advocates, uh, proponents and opponents of this legislation. But I, I would say this, the first step on that pathway, Madam Chair, would be to utilize existing licensed Care, for care programs. Um, so, you know, we know from a survey that we've just completed and just published that programs are reporting that their license programs are reporting that they're at 53% capacity versus where they were um, before the pandemic. Um, and that's an awful lot of unused capacity in existing programs. Why is that beneficial? Those existing programs, we know who they are. They've been through licensing. They've demonstrated their commitment to professional development. They've, they've done all that we've asked them to do um, to become licensed. I, I think that should be absolutely our first resort um, for, for placing kids in, in safe, high quality learning environments um, when they're not in school. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from Mr. McSherry? Uh, Ms. Push is not in fact here. Any other questions? All right, uh, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Delegate Smith for the bill. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 1307. We move next, uh, Delegate Kipke, House Bill 1185. Delegate Kipke, I know I saw you in the Zoom. There we are. Oh, okay, excellent. Hi, Madam Chairman. Thanks for uh, the time today to, to be heard, and good afternoon to the members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, House Bill 1185 is an attempt at uh, solving an issue that many uh, student athletes are experiencing. Uh, Delegate Haven Shoemaker has a bill that you already heard that uh, handles it a little bit differently. Uh, but this bill um, was created for the purpose of um, pro providing a little uh, support to the small number of students that might actually want to take up uh, this option. Uh, put simply what it would do, uh, and frankly, it's uh, one of the weirdest bills I've ever had drafted, but this has been one of the weirdest times of my life and probably most people listening's life. Um, it would allow a student who is currently a junior who is has not been able to compete athletically because uh, they've not been allowed to uh, play uh, to continue on in their studies as they would normally, uh, you know, move on uh, and not... Uh, uh, slow down with their studies, uh, but just be in, uh, re uh, classified as a junior uh, for the purposes of college recruitment. Um, there uh, are students uh, that I know who are intentionally failing to repeat their junior year. And I just think that's horrible that that's happening. Uh, but if you put yourselves in uh, the shoes of some of these students, and I think it's a small number, uh, they have a lot at stake They're, you know, they've played for many years, they've competed for many years, they've worked on their skills for many years, and a lot of the goals uh, relate to uh, being uh, recruited for college athletics and the scholarships that come along with that. So uh, I know some of the school systems don't like this idea. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, hey, I don't really like it either. But I think it's a small and, and reasonable thing that can be done for uh, student athletes who have uh, worked hard throughout their entire youth uh, to get ready for college recruitment. Uh, lastly, I'll say I passed this by the NCAA to get their perspective on it. And uh, they do say that it, this may work for some students. Um, 
uh, it's an option, uh, but they would need to check with the recruiting college to make sure that uh, the goals are aligned. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude my testimony and be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Delegate Kipke. Uh, any questions uh, for Delegate Kipke? All right, Delegate, uh, seeing no questions, we are done with the hearing on House Bill 1185. There's no one here signed up to testify. We'll next move to House Bill 1296, Delegate Walker. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. House Bill 1296. For the record, I'm Delegate Jay Walker presenting House Bill 1296, uh, Public School Students Daily Physical Activity, Student Health and Fitness Act. Uh, it's the PE bill that we've been fighting for. Uh, the requirements of the bill require at least uh, 90 minutes of PE education, as well as understanding and go cooperating with a student's individual IEP plan. I think that's important as well. And it also prohibits removing students from recess as a disciplinary action. Uh, why is this bill important? What's the problem? You all heard the statistics before. 70% uh, of students that are obese end up having long-term health effects. Uh, uh, children six to eight years old with obesity problems are approximately 10 times more likely to become obese adults. Uh, move down, uh, sent a packet that has all the statistics that I'm rattling off that you all should have. But uh, overall, we spend almost $190 billion a year to treat obesity. Uh, children with obesity are three times more likely to have health care expenses that uh, include in this total to $14 billion a year. That being said, I'm just going to ask the committee, uh, last year we took it up, uh, brought this bill out on the floor because I thought the importance of it, we made a tremendous investment in our educational system in the state. And it's been interesting, if you take a look at the fiscal note, when I first started this, uh, they used to say this bill will cost $24 million and it went down to $19 million. And now uh, this has probably been the most general fiscal note that we've had, saying basically what we've known all along with a lot of existing resources, this can be done. It's a bipartisan effort. Uh, we've had up to 74 sponsors on this bill before. Uh, I would ask this body to pass out the bill that we passed a couple of years ago that we went over to the Senate. And over in the Senate, we just couldn't get along in terms of what the floor should be, not the ceiling. Uh, I don't think a floor is acceptable in 40 minutes. And that being said, we currently have five counties in the state of Maryland that currently do 90 minutes minimum. So we need to get that work statewide. And another growing problem that I've learned for anybody who represents the Eastern Shore is uh, on the Eastern Shore, maybe need, this committee needs to start looking at middle school. Uh, you've got some middle schools out there uh, on the shore where the kids are middle school students, don't have PE at all for a certain semester, and sometimes they have it one day a week. So with that being said, I think you all know uh, what this bill does. Last stats out there out there. Uh, when you take a look at uh, ranking states in childhood obesity, uh, Maryland ranks ninth out of 51, uh, 50 states in the DC. We rank ninth. Um, so this is an opportunity to do something about it. Hope I can get your support, send the bill over to the Senate and we can, make, uh, we can try and make a difference. With that being said, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, any questions? All right, uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, we are done with the hearing on House Bill 1296. We're going next to uh, Delegate Washington, House Bill 1322, and then uh, thereafter uh, a reordering of taking House Bill 1278 before 1181. Um, Delegate Washington, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, Delegate Alonzo Washington on House Bill 1322, uh, which is a bill that will protect our educators and school personnel who are vulnerable to COVID-19. On January 20, 2021, the governor and the state superintendent of schools abruptly and without adequately consulting with stakeholders announced significant revisions to the State Department of Education's Maryland School Reopening Guidance. Um, the governor's referenced retaliatory actions in the other in other states against educators and indicated that the office of the governor and the State Department of Education will use every legal avenue to force a return to in-person instruction, regardless of local conditions and the preferences of local communities. Uh, we know right now that educators are struggling with remote learning 
that our students are struggling with remote learning. And what we do know is that all of our teachers want to return to the classroom. There's no doubt that all of our teachers want to return to the classroom. But this governor has, has indicated that he is willing to go to bat, to go to law, to use every vehicle he can use to make sure that teachers go back to their classroom. He, he has threatened our teachers by using retaliati retaliatory uh, messaging. You know, there's legitimate concerns that I know that the governor has. Um, however, there's also legitimate concerns about the unsafe working conditions within our schools during a deadly pandemic. We are still in a global pandemic right now, every members of the committee, and and the governor's the governor's the governor's the governor's words shows a lack of empathy for these essential workers, for our teachers, and for every essential worker in the classroom and in our school buildings. What this bill aims to do, and I'm introducing this bill, is to protect individuals from any form of retaliation who are at least 60 years old and have an underlying med medical condition that puts them at risk, at increased risk from COVID-19 or live with someone who does or has not received the full course of the vaccine and, and chooses not to return to the school building for in-person instruction. You know, this bill ensures that these educators and school personnel can choose to stay home until they and their loved ones are vaccinated without the fear of losing their job or the state or their state certification. It also requires that the county boards of education make accommodation for educators who choose to work remotely to ensure that their lives are not made. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that their lives are not made more difficult because of that decision. Uh, educators, many of whom you know will be willing to, you, who you'll be hearing from today, have risen to the challenge during this pandemic. The state is, is failing and unwilling to provide remote work options to the extent practicable as a reasonable accommodation for educators seeking to protect their safety and that of their families due to an underlying medical issue. When such an uncompromising approach is taken, it only depletes our ability to retain educators at a time when, our, when staffing our school is increasingly difficult. I don't believe that educators shouldn't, educators shouldn't be forced to choose between their job and their health or the health of family members. I ask this committee to move this bill favorably to protect the vulnerable workers and their family members. Our teachers deserve better from this governor. Our teachers deserve better from MSDE. I didn't wanna have to bring this bill here, uh, but this governor required it due to his words of retaliation towards our teachers, towards our essential workers, and that's not right. So Madam Chair, I ask for a favor report for this bill. Uh uh, thank you, Delegate Washington. I, I do have a question before Delegate Ebersole has a question. Um, and uh, I thank you for pointing out that our teacher- If, if the question is who call, who was calling me, I don't know. They, no, uh, that's, not, that's not my question. I have a serious, okay. <laughs> serious question, Delegate Washington. Um, uh, first, I, I just want to thank you for pointing out that our teachers want to go back to work and uh, rejecting that false narrative that's uh, being put out there by some. Um, it's my understanding that if, if a, uh, a teacher who's over 60 who has asked for accommodation to stay home uh, being uh, due to their own health issues, or let's say they're um, uh, getting chemo or radiation or an immediate family member who lives with them, that those teachers have been rejected in getting an accommodation. Is that that's your correct. opinion as well? That's correct. All right, so so that's that's what this bill is really designed to, uh, that's what this bill is designed to help with. Correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Delegate Ebersole with a question. Yeah, so thank you very much for this bill. Um, teachers do need protection. And I think it's important for us to stop using the phrase teachers are going back to work. We all use it. It was used liberally earlier today in our legislature. They are working. They could go back to their place of work or where they worked previously. And to that end, then, these teachers who would want to stay home, they don't want to stop working, do they? They just don't feel like they want to go to the building. 
Correct. No, our teachers are constantly working and they're working overtime many times. I have stories and right. stories of teachers who have been working more and more uh, during this virtual learning than they did actually in the classroom. Uh, yes. Our teacher, I know our teachers really want to get back to the classroom and see their and see their te- and see their students in person. Um, they just want to do it in a safe way, you know, to make sure they're vaccinated, make sure their family members are taken care of, and making sure that our students are safe at, in the time being as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delegate Washington. Any other questions for Delegate Washington? All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, we'll move on to. Some of the people signed up to members, there are uh, nine people signed up. So we'll take, and just one unfavorable. So we'll take the first few and then set of questions. And then again, another panel of uh, people with some questions uh, and then we'll ask some questions. Then we'll move on to the unfavorable. We'll start with Jennifer Horst. Is Ms. Horst here? Hello, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Greetings, Madam Chair and honorable members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, It's an honor to be here. My name is Jennifer Hurst and I am a special education case manager and special education content teacher in Washington County Public School System. Today I'm providing testimony in support of House Bill 1322 a bill that would provide necessary ADA protections for many educators like myself who are struggling to make the difficult choice between caring for our families and ourselves and returning to us to in-school instruction. Um, On July 26th of 2020, my fiance sustained a spinal cord injury um, and it left him paralyzed from the shoulders down. This resulted in his need for around the clock care. So the injury also caused him to be um, immunocompromised. Since I'm his caregiver, I had to take a leave of absence when the students returned to in-person instruction. Um, Then when my county switched to virtual learning, I was able to teach um, my students virtually from home. Now that the county has a return to in-building instruction, I again was forced to take a leave. Um, My fear is that returning to the school building without being fully vaccinated puts my fiance and my own health in danger. And so I've gone through the process of requesting ADA accommodations from our school system to continue virtual instruction from home, but I have been denied. Um, As an educator who has taught special education for 22 years, I must admit that I am very concerned and distraught about this process. I love my students very much and I love what I do, but I feel like as an educator, I'm being forced to choose between my students and my family's life and my life, the people that I love. So I believe that this bill, House Bill 1322, will make a difference for educators like myself who don't wanna have to make that difficult choice. The bill provides protections that allow me to protect my family while keeping my job. For these reasons, I humbly ask for your favorable favorable vote on House Bill 1322. Thank you very much for letting me share my experience. Thank you and and sorry certainly for um, your fiance's uh, uh, challenges um, to you both. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Ms. Linda Cohen. Is Ms. Cohen here? Uh, I'll, I'll call on the next person. We'll, uh, we'll come back. Uh, Ms. Bost, Cheryl Bost from MSEA. Uh, good evening, or good afternoon still. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee, you heard from an educator that these are real life stories. Um, these are life and job stories, and in some places, death. I the the bill is so necessary because of what's happening in our school districts. So, you know, Delegate Washington explained the bill. I'm going to share more of what's happening. We just now, right before coming on, received a denial from the Inspector General for Education to intercede on the behalf of educators who are being denied. 
Um, he said he will not investigate it and we could go to the EEOC or the Commission for Civil Rights. Those could take years to help people who want to go back to work in a healthy and safe environment. And that's what this bill is providing for. Um, and in some cases, my county in particular, Baltimore County, they're denying everybody. But then as people start to take their own leave, they're pulling them up on disciplinary charges for use of leave. So people are getting caught into this, I have to resign or I have to retire if they're eligible. So we are not treating individual educators as we as teachers are taught to treat our students as individuals and listen to the circumstances. And as you stated, these educators still want to do their job. We have students and families who are choosing to still remain virtual. So there are positions and adaptations that could be made so that they could still be working and uh, not risk their life or their family's life. We have people with chemotherapy that they're going through that are being denied. The systems are failing to follow the accommodation process by having an interactive conversation with people and they're just doing blanket denials. And in Carroll County, their plan is to start March 15th with everybody in school and have no social distancing in many areas. So we have systems who are not taking the mitigation process seriously. They're not taking the ADA accommodation process seriously. And we have the governor and other agencies who are throwing up their hands and saying, we don't care, go back into the buildings. We are asking for your help on these individual cases where people have legitimate reasons. This isn't, I just wanna sit home because I feel like sitting home. These are legitimate reasons and legitimate cases for people who need these accommodations. So we request a favorable report on this bill and we need it now, not so much later and, and, and wait for court cases to go through. We thank you for your help. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bost. Uh, we'll next take uh, Linda Cohen who is signed in during the last three minutes. Go ahead. Hello. Greetings, honorable members of the House and Ways and Means Committee. My name is Linda Cohen and I am a full-time physical education teacher in Baltimore County, in Baltimore County Elementary School. Today I'm providing testimony in support of House Bill 1322, a bill that will provide necessary ADA protect protections for many educators like myself. My school system asked all special area teachers to report back to the building on February 22nd, 2021. This caused heightened anxiety for me because I am 58 years old and have underlying medical conditions, including high blood pressure. In addition, my husband is a heart patient who underwent a quadruple bypass. My fear for the past month has been that returning to the school building without being fully vaccinated would put my health and my family's health at risk. I have gone through the process of requesting ADA accommodations from my school system to continue virtual education from home until I'm fully vaccinated. I was previously denied. But today, just minutes before this hearing began, I received a phone call from my principal that my request had been approved. I am extremely lucky that this decision was overturned and I am grateful that I will be able to teach my students virtually until I'm fully vaccinated. However, I know that there are so many of my colleagues across the state who have not been granted the same accommodations. The outcome in my case proves that it is possible to make these adjustments work for educators who feel that it is unsafe for them to return to the school building at this time. My professional passion for the past 32 years has been to do what is best for children. We as teachers cannot possibly do what is best for children if we become ill with this tragic virus. I believe House Bill 1322 will make a difference for educators like myself who do not want to make the difficult choice between their personal and family health and returning to in-school instruction. The bill provides protections that allow myself and my fellow teachers to protect their families while keeping their jobs. For these reasons, I humbly ask for your favorable vote on House Bill 1322. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we next have Ida. Cortesis, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, ma'am, Cortesis, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, honorable members of the House Ways and Means Committee. 
My name is Aida Corteses, and I'm a paraeducator for Hartford Technical High School in Hartford County, where I also help English language learner students. Today, I'm, I'm providing testimony in support of HB 1322, a bill that will provide necessary ADA protections for many educators like me. I have type 1 diabetes. The CDC lists diabetes as an underlying condition that may put individuals at an increased risk for severe illness if they get COVID-19. On September 22, 2020, I requested and was approved to utilize virtual learning. I was informed at the time of my status change that I was temporarily approved until a student assigned to me returns to in-person instruction. Throughout the pandemic, I have expressed my concern about going back into the classroom setting without being fully vaccinated. My request to remain virtual until I have been fully vaccinated have been denied three times. Fortunately, I received my first dose of vaccine this past Friday. But knowing that you are only partially protected until you receive a full dose has me worried. I don't think it's right to put people who have high risk conditions like mine back in school buildings without allowing them to get fully vaccinated, especially when not all of our students are going back to in school instruction and will need to work virtually. I believe HB 1322 will make a difference for the educators like me who have to make the difficult choice between their personal and family health and returning to the buildings. I humbly ask for your favor vote on HB 1322. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, for these first four uh, witnesses who spoke? Uh, I, I guess I'll just ask the simple question. Uh, are we, the, the teachers who uh, who you refer to Ms. Bost and some others did, these are teachers that are working at home teaching virtually up to this point? Yeah, they're teachers and our support staff who are currently working virtually. Okay, and they're not complaining about the virtual teaching. They're not asking. No, for they're, they're not complaining. The only one is Ms. Hurst who asked to be kept virtual and has had to take leave instead because her system wouldn't allow her to, but the others are all working virtually. All right, thank you. I'm gonna mm -hmm. up the, the next four and then we'll have another set of questions. Uh, Ms. Diana Bergman. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Diana Bergman and I am asking you, this is an emergency, to have a favorable report for House Bill 1322. Okay, last board of ed meeting, a board member made the discriminatory comment that too many staff who have obesity, type two um, diabetes or smoke will be impractical to allow them to continue teleworking and avoid diet, okay? This, at the end of the day, the, the, the ones being hurt the most are the children, our children. My child, 11 years old in the fifth grade saying, I need to return virtually, but I don't wanna hurt my friends and teachers until I get vaccinated. Emotionally unavailable to learn right now, okay? My senior this year, because of retaliatory motions and actions taken by our board in Baltimore County, um, we have lowered our academic standards for kids to play sports. He's played baseball every single season for school since he's been in school. His senior year, he's refusing to play because we lowered the standards and kids that didn't meet the academic standards are going to take time on the field. And that's not fair. We have taken a lot from our kids to, to, to do this to them because that's, that's what happens while adults are arguing back and forth making threats. At the end of the day, the ones that get hurt emotionally and their education experience are impacted are our children. So we can't wait another day. This can't be, you know, this cannot continue. This behavior cannot continue. We have board of ed members that have no idea how ADA compliance works, making decisions, speeding up reopening process and phases that is just unheard of, unimaginable. Like we need to do better. We need to set a better example for our children. And we don't treat other people like that. We teach our children to be to show empathy towards others. And we're all grown adults. So why are we being such bullies to our educators? 
the ones that help our children learn and expand their creativity so they could be successful members of society. Why are we doing and treating our educators this way? We're better than this. So we shouldn't wait any longer. We need to move forward on this and protect our teachers. This is not, you know, we need to, we, we, enough of the, the back and forth bickering and stuff. Our teachers want to work, let them work while they protect their health. You know, that's just a basic civil life, uh, right to me when it comes to health. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Uh, we next have Teresa Dudley. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Teresa Mitchell Dudley and I am a middle school social studies and science teacher in Prince George's County. But I'm also honored to serve as the president of the Prince George's County Education Association. And our membership includes approximately 10,000 classroom teachers and certified staff. Um, PGCEA supports House Bill 1322, the legislation sponsored by Delegate Alonzo Washington that is drafted in response to some unavoidable risk and impossible choices that school systems have forced on particular classes of educators who are otherwise not <clears throat> qualified for accommodation, but to force in school buildings during the pandemic. We watched as the governor threatened us in front of the militia, in front of the National Guard, and threatened to do what they did in Chicago and what they've done in Ohio and what they've done in North Carolina. Schools are not closed. Our educators have been working. School is in session. However, threatening us with our lives is not the way to go about it. We have great inequities in vaccine distribution. Prince George's County and Baltimore City are having a terrible time with vaccines not being available. Many of our educators have not even gotten their first dose of the two dose. Um, and it is unconscionable to send them back to school or back into a building without being inoculated. On Monday night, we had an accommodations um, webinar where we had close to 500 educators on the line with questions about what's going to happen. The anxiety was so high. Um, we had Jacqueline Anderson, who takes care of her 90-year-old dad who has COPD and her 74-year-old aunt. And she's worried about going back to school and catching, bringing the virus home and killing her father. I got another call from a teacher who teaches at an early childhood center, who one of her three-year-old students was in intensive care because he had COVID. The children don't even know that they have the virus. And while they're asymptomatic, they still can carry the virus. Even if you have the, the vaccine, you can take it home to your families. I have another member who has sickle cell anemia who wants to be able to teach virtually. We have many of our members who have immune deficiencies. And what I'm concerned about is losing these educators to the profession if they're not allowed to work from home. We're having the darndest time trying to keep educators, educators in the classroom and the pipeline is shortening as we speak. So I ask for a favorable report on this bill because it is important for us to let our educators who have been working. Ms. Dudley, the, the, the time. So uh, I share your favorably favorably on the for bill. educators. Thank you. All right, thank you. We next have Timothy Trailer. He's not here. Thank you. Uh, and then last we have uh, Zach Taylor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Zach Taylor and I'm a middle school teacher in Baltimore City and I'm also a vice president in the Baltimore Teachers Union and BTU supports House Bill 1322. Uh, something that's important to underscore is that this bill protects not just educators uh, whose health is at risk, it also helps students and families in the instructional environment, uh, especially in a place like Baltimore City. Uh, the past two weeks, uh, we've seen the return of several thousand staff to school buildings here in Baltimore City, which has been exciting for us. But it's important to note that the majority of Baltimore City school families continue to choose to send 
children to school virtually and have indicated their preference to do so for the remainder of the school year. Uh, due to the limited vaccine supply here in Baltimore City and the very restricted accommodations process that you've already heard some about, uh, a process that here is denying accommodations even for staff who have severe respiratory conditions. Uh, some staff have been put in the challenging position you've been hearing about where they're choosing between their families and their job, between their personal health and a paycheck, and really choosing with uh, to toss up their relationship with students, students who they've been the baseline for consistency throughout this pandemic. Uh, and it's due to not having the protections we need. Uh, many vulnerable staff and those with high-risk families are not currently given the option to work remotely, even though that's where, in some cases, all of their students remain. And instead, many are faced with taking unpaid leave and being replaced by a substitute teacher with no established relationship with the students, even when the established classroom teacher could continue to work in the virtual environment, uh, which again is where most of the students are. This is not just bad for educators and families, it hurts the quality of instruction for our students who need consistency and stability during this time when we're all working together as hard as we can to limit learning loss as much as possible. In Baltimore City, family health risks are not a primary determinant in the city school's accommodation process. While many city school staff have been receiving the initial rounds of vaccination, and we look forward to that continuing, the vast majority have not yet been able to take advantage of that process. And we received that request and that request for further information more than anything else. Um, this bill is a common sense measure to address these concerns. And as educators, we're very eager to return to in-person instruction, and there's no place we'd rather be. Um, but those who are still waiting on a vaccine do not wanna put themselves or their high-risk families uh, at risk. And this bill is narrowly tailored to address those who face high-risk high risk medical situations and those who wanna be vaccinated, but they just haven't been able to yet. Uh, this helps ensure consistency and higher educational quality for our students. It protects the vulnerable and it helps keep our school system staffed with full-time professionals while ensuring that schools aren't overwhelmed with substitute teachers with uh, personnel who are students and families. Don't Mr. Know. Taylor, thank you for thank, uh, thank your you. time. Uh, uh, are there any questions for the uh, last three people who testified? All right, seeing none, thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, we next have Mr. Vince McAvoy signed up unfavorable on the bill. He's not here. Okay, thank you, Haley. Uh, Mr. McAvoy is not here. We are done with the hearing on House Bill 1322. As I said, we have to switch the order between House uh, the sixth and seventh bills on the list. Delegate Ebersol, House Bill 1278, please. You have to unmute yourself. Well, that grandiose introduction will not be repeated. Thanks for having me here today. Um, the past year has been one of many unique challenges and characteristics. The COVID pandemic has forced the closure of schools and then school buildings. Childcare has been simultaneously challenged to keep their existing populations while struggling to find capacity for new categories and ages of children, that as we heard earlier today, from families in need of their services. Technology and access to the internet and Wi-Fi are badly needed and in demand and not uniformly or equitably, equitably available. Protecting students and staff and even community from contracting the COVID virus is a new expense and a new task and must be done effectively. Add to this the new charges that come with both blueprint bills along with already existing responsibilities and MSDE is looking at a table set with much more on each plate. MSDE must address all of these, it's their job both directly and in terms of guidance to local systems and local businesses and local child cares. Information about the plans to address these has at times been difficult to ascertain. For example, we do not have a clear accounting of the use or lack thereof of CARES money from the federal government. There has not been clear communi communication with lawmakers or local systems regarding the status of devices and hotspots or connectivity. And now there's not clear communication about plans for school reopenings. Now, there, there are more, but it's time for a clear evaluation of management and accountability, especially in this time. Furthermore, while the pandemic has exposed these gaps, the need for management capacity and accountability audit is not new. This was clear several years ago, 
long before this new wave of responsibilities associated with COVID. Legislation was enacted that required a work group to study management capacity and organizational structure of the department. The superintendent was assigned to chair this work group. The group then rarely met and few if any of the recommendations were made. However, a management capacity evaluation was needed and still is. And it's now past time for an outside look at the accountability and capacity and even perhaps the structure of the department. For a work group to take a clear look at and evaluate an organization, it needs a makeup of individuals who are not enmeshed in the process and can be objective. It is time for an outside look at the accountability capacity of this department. The legislation that I have proposed here will create a vehicle to do just that. It will give us valuable information. In the face of the new and existing challenges cited here, the time is right. If one adds to this that a new leader of the department will be put in place in July, it becomes e an even more opportune moment for such an evaluation. Thank you for listening to me and I urge a favorable report. Uh, thank you, Delegate Ebersol. Any questions for Delegate Ebersol? All right, thank you, Delegate. Uh, we have uh, one person signed up, Ms. Uh, Diana Bergman. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, again. Um, I'm requesting a favorable report. Um, it's needed, it's just common sense. We've been doing this before. Um, we need to know what happened, especially with this CARES money. What I've witnessed um, during the shutdown, um, PEBT benefits for families in Maryland still have not rolled out for the month of October, November, and December. And everybody knows if children don't have food, if they're hungry, we can't get children to learn, regardless if it's virtual or in person. So I don't think that our families and our students that need it the most help and support from this relief act got access to what they needed and we needed to find out what happened and how to fix that our special education students we had to roll back a lot of their ieps their their interventions their related services for ot prior to all this they probably had 30 minutes a week of ot instruction because we had to go virtual a lot of our kids got 15 minutes a month of consultation, not even the implementation of what they needed for OT. So we owe this to our kids to find out how we missed the mark on getting them relief and supports and need it, that the, these children need it. And those children are owed to know what we're gonna do to be able to provide what they needed. And moving forward, there's still gonna be more rollout from the federal government to give the state of Maryland relief and support for recovery through all this. And we need to make sure that we're using every single penny adequately, responsibly, transparent. And the General Assembly has every right to know what, how we've been spending this money. I mean, every year we have our capital budget, our operating budget at each of our 24 jurisdictions and it lays out county and state funds, but we don't know how we've been using this federal relief and support. So please, a favorable report. And if you have any questions, I'm still here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Uh, any questions for Ms. Bergman? All right, thank you, Ms. Bergman. Uh, thank you, Delegate Ebersole. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 1278. Uh, back to the, uh, the, the regularly scheduled timing. We're gonna go to Delegate Guyton, House Bill. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, just thank uh, you. give me one second. Just uh, giving a little uh, foreshadow after uh, that bill, we have two very brief um, local bills that uh, uh, Delegate Feldmark will be presenting. And then we have a bill with uh, 30 witnesses signed up. So we'll start with yes. Delta. <laughs> thank you. Hopefully I don't have 30, but thank you for your consideration of House Bill 1181. For the record, I'm Delegate Michelle Guyton from District 42B, and I want to assure Delegate Ebersole that this is the very last special education bill I'm going to bring this year to our committee. So um, 
I am honored to present this bill, the Non-Visual Access Accountability Act for Education, on behalf of the National Federation of the Blind of Maryland. So in 2018, the General Assembly passed House Bill 1088, which required digital tools procured by the state to be accessible to those who are vision impaired. Very simple. Unfortunately, educational curriculum was not included included in this because it's generally procured at the county level. And House Bill 1181 seeks to remedy that problem. And it's one that became very obvious during virtual learning as we've heard over and over again in this committee. So blind students have been particularly impacted by the lack of assistive technologies and equitable access to educational programming this year, despite the very clear requirements in federal law that we must provide them. So many students have been unable to participate in specific classes or activities because the technologies purchased by their jurisdictions do not interface with non-visual accessibility platforms. So House Bill 1181 puts disability accountability measures in place during the local procurement process for digital technologies um, that are already in place in the state procurement process. By requiring vendors to submit an accessibility conformance report demonstrating how their technology complies with federal, federal accessibility standards, um, and then this bill also adds a representative who specializes in providing vision services as part of the evaluation team for bids in procurement. And in addition, the bill adds a requirement that local school systems make this information accessible on their websites for public transparency. So I urge a favorable report on House Bill 1181. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Guyton. Any questions for Delegate Guyton? All right, uh, we have uh, a few people signed up. I'll call first on the two that are uh, favorable. Uh, first, Sharon Manecki. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Um, this is a very good bill because it's all common sense. Uh, people should be involved in the procurement who know something about it, and that is there with the vision department. Now, um, Delegate Guyton, uh, I think, did two amendments. And I want to uh, talk to you about, the, about them for a minute. One of them um, says that if the vision department can't um, help out on the procurement, that the local school system should consult. The amendment is to, to consult with the low vision uh, blindness specialist that's part of the Division of Special Education and Early Intervention. Um, the bill says DOORS, that was a mistake. DOORS is an adult program and um, that's why that amendment is very necessary. So if you look at the fiscal note, it says that um, DOORS has to, it, under the state expenditures, it says that DOORS has to uh, get two new positions. That's um, wouldn't be true if you passed the amendment, and we hope that you will. Uh, also, I want to tell you that the person, the, the blindness low vision specialist position is already filled, and so that part of the fiscal note should go away. Um, I think that there's some confusion about what we're talking about with concerning accessibility. So, um, Think about the ADA. Because of accessibility, buildings have to have ramps. They have to have doors that are not too heavy so that everybody can open them. So what we're talking about in terms of ac is access to computers, to the programs. So it's the same thing as the ramps and the doors. So you wouldn't wait for somebody, uh, for, a, for a delegate in a wheelchair to be elected before you would put a ramp on a building. And so you shouldn't wait for a blind student to show up to have accessible platforms. So the fiscal note talks about the IEP. This is not an IEP issue. This is an issue of general accessibility so that people can use the programs. Um, the local uh, school systems have a variety of things in the fiscal note. Um, mostly we don't believe that new positions are needed uh, because 
the, for example, what it talks about there in Baltimore City, they, um, they say they need somebody to work with the vendors on the VPAT or the conformance report. That's a report that the vendor does by themselves. You don't work with them. That's their report about their program. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Vanecki. Uh, we next have uh, a student, uh, Derek Day, to speak to us this afternoon. Welcome. Hello, my name is Derek Day. Um, I am a 15-year-old uh, ninth grader that goes to Westminster High School. Um, I have a sister who is in seventh grade. She's also blind. Um, and we are both been impacted by uh, the, the switch to virtual learning and in, in more importantly, the technology that came with that, um, the, the switch from in-person education, so more talking and displaying of content to uh, a, an atmosphere where all of, our, all of our materials are accessed on the internet and through our computers. Um, sorry, please vote for, <laughs> please vote for Bill uh, 1181 because the, it will really help students like us um, when, when it comes to accessing materials and being able to participate with our classes, um, it, it will impact me. So, you know, me and my sister, obviously, who are kids who are in Jedi classes and ho hope to join the workforce in, you know, with, with this knowledge that we're gaining now, it, it will help us be able to compete with our sighted peers, which will, you know, even after virtual learning, which will provide more of a level playing field when it comes to gaining knowledge and then later applying that into, you know, our, our work later in life. Um, blind students have the same accessibility issues every year. It's not something that just showed up because of virtual learning. Math is extremely hard. Um, every year there's practice, there's practice websites that are never accessible. Um, there's online input methods. Uh, Equatio being one of them is a big Chrome extension that, that people use to type math online. And it's not, it, you know, it's not easy to use. Um, Khan Academy is one of the practice websites that, that people often use, and that one is completely inaccessible. Uh, this bill would, would kind of, uh, in, you know, encourage those companies to create accessible platforms that students could use because there's no reason I should not be able to practice math. And by the same token, it, it will also promote school systems to pick uh, companies that have, you know, that, that have made that change and that will, that will create an atmosphere where companies need to, because if they want the business, they have to comply. And, you know, they obviously want the business. So that's a big deal. Um, I'm taking geometry, physics, and chemistry. And uh, I have to use Equatio, which I said, to input a lot of my geometry and, and physics uh, math, as well as Cami, which is a PDF editor. And it allows people to write and use a lot more graphics um, where you have to draw. And both of those are completely inaccessible. It's, it's actually created times where I've gotten materials days, you know, three, four days later than my classmates. And it's kind of hard to meet due dates when stuff's like happening after, but the class can't stop. So you just fall behind and it, it's a big deal. Um, so again, th this bill will promote that all to become more accessible. Um, there was actually, sorry, one second. Well, Mr. Day, actually, your, your time is up. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. Uh, but I could see you were trying to figure out what your next thing, uh, that you were wondering if you had forgot something. Did you have a final point you w wish to add? Um, yeah, there, there's one final thing. I, I was taking a computer science class, which is what I want to go into when I get older. Um, and the, the uh, platform used was co uh, code.org, which is completely inaccessible to me. And I actually had to drop the class. So that is a big deal because that's the field I want to enter. And if I can't even take the class to, you know, start that, that education toward my career, like that's a huge deal. So please vote for this bill, 1181. All right. Uh, thank you both. Um, any questions for Ms. Manecki or uh, uh, this young gentleman, uh, Mr. Mr. Day? All right. Thank you both very much. We'll move on to the favorable with amendment, but before doing so, I'll pass things along to uh, Delegate Barnes while I have to uh, to uh, attend to another meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next up is uh, Jonathan Lazar. 
Hi there. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lazar. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland in the College of Information Studies. I am also the incoming director of the TRACE Center for Research and Development, the nation's oldest research center on technology and disability. Um, however, I'm here today representing my own opinion and not that of the University of Maryland or the TRACE Center. Uh, I support the bill with amendments. I'll, I'll talk about the amendment suggestion in a minute. Um, but overall, the reason why I support the bill is that county boards of education should not procure digital technologies and content that are inaccessible for students with disabilities. The great news is there are existing solutions for how to avoid this problem. And you heard uh, Delegate Guyton mention those, right? The state of Maryland is already using procurement to enforce accessible technology. Uh, federal government is using it. Um, at the University of Maryland, we use it. We, I mean, universities, companies, using procurement as a lever for accessible technology. It's a proven solution. There are a lot of resources out there. Vendors know about it, the um, VPAT, um, that, which is a type of conformance report. It's, it's well known. These are solutions that companies know how to do, vendors know how to do. Um, so we, we know there are these solutions. We just need to port these solutions over to the K-12 environment with um, county boards of education. So this is a successful strategy of using procurement. Not only does it eliminate barriers for students with disabilities, it also saves money. Because what often happens? What often happens is that a county board of education will procure a technology. It'll be inaccessible. They have to go back and forth and fight with the vendor. Maybe the county winds up trying to remediate it or make changes. Uh, it costs time and money, right? Procure it accessibly in the first place. Here's my suggested amendment. Uh, the way the bill is written, the bill is written in a way where it asks a vendor to indemnify after the technology has already been procured and paid for. Um, and I would suggest that the best practice is actually requiring the indemnification clause to be in the original uh, call for proposals for the technology and in the procurement contract. Um, so the, the uh, indemnification is totally the right idea. That's a best practice that's been used across the country. Um, it's just that you don't procure the technology, pay for it, find it's inaccessible, and then ask the vendor to indemnify. Um, so you want to put it earlier on in the contract. Um, otherwise, I'm fully in support of the bill, um, and I, I appreciate this is a great idea. It's a best practice. Thank you, Delegate Guyton, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lazar. Are there any questions for Mr. Lazar? Seeing none. Uh, next up is uh, Garrett Mooney. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, committee members. Thank you for allowing me to testify today on behalf of HB 1181. Public education uh, public, uh, public education has promised to provide a free and appropriate and access to all materials for all children. We need accountability so the promises and commitments made to our children are kept. In August 2020, the Maryland Organization of Parents of Blind Children, a division of the National Federation of the Blind of Maryland, wanted to make sure schools across the state would fulfill the promises and commitments made to our blind children as schools moved to virtual instruction necessitated by COVID-19. We sent a letter to all local school districts and state and superintendent Karen B. Salmon asking how schools would offer services unique to blind students. Real instruction and orientation and mobility Along with, we asked how how school dish, how school districts would ensure all instructional materials would be accessible to blind and low vision students, and how evaluations and assessments of blind students would be carried out. Out of the 24 districts in the state, only 10 responded. Some of those responses attempted to answer our questions, but. Most either referred us back to the letter sent by State Superintendent Solomon or did not answer the questions directly. The districts who answered our questions in regards to accessible instructional materials informed us that adaptive technology used by blind children such as screen readers and braille displays had been deployed and were available to students. Delegates, screen readers, 
and braille displays help the, stu the student read the computer screen, but they do not work when the computer programs being read are not accessible. The creators of these technology-based instructional materials, such as Google Classroom, Seesaw, Schoology, and many others must incorporate accessibility in the program's design. It is the responsibility of the local school systems to not purchase or use these programs if they are not accessible. The purchasing of accessible instructional materials has been a failed promise for years and is not a new problem created by COVID-19. Kelly and her son, Taylor, who are both members of MDPBOC, have been fighting their district for years on the inaccessible Chromebooks used by the district. Kelly has asked her district for years to provide Tyler a Windows laptop because the Chromebook given to him by the district is not accessible with screen readers. Mr. Rather, Money, your, Mr. Money, your time is up. Can you summarize for me? Yes, sir. Real quick. Uh, basically, what happened, delegates, is that this student used his own birthday money and Christmas money to go buy his own laptop because the district would not give him an accommodation for computer that worked. My myself have the same problems with my daughter. She's not able to access any of the materials that the school district of Baltimore City asks uh, students to use to read for lessons. And we even had to pay money and acquire readers to administer assessments. Uh, this is a failed promise that's been happening in this state, but all across the country for years. And you have a chance today to hold districts accountable as well as vendors. And we ask that you fulfill those promises and commitments to all students. Thank you, Mr. Mooney, for your uh, presentation. Uh, members, are there any questions for Mr. Mooney? Seeing that there's only one unfavorable uh, Drew Jabin. He's not here. He's not here? No. There are no other questions. This concludes the hearing for House Bill 1181. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out this day. Uh, next up is uh, Delegate Felmark and the two uh, Howard County bills. Uh, first one up, 1189. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so House Bill 1189, colleagues, I am here just to give you an update, not to ask for a, a report. Um, the delegation has not yet acted on this bill. There was a fairly substantial um, amendment that was offered and that is still being considered and, and pursued. So um, we'll keep you posted and, and submit a request, uh, you know, once, um, once that's appropriate, once the delegation has acted. So um, that's the, the status update on House Bill 1189. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Delegate Felmark? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on 1189. Next up, House Bill 1190, Delegate Felmark. Thank you. Um, okay, so House Bill 1190, uh, the, the delegation did act in support, so I'm asking for your favorable report. Um, House Bill 1190 deals with the redetermination of geographic attendance areas, but more importantly and, and more accurately, it deals with monitoring and reporting on school capacity utilization. And, um, and so our our Board of Education uh, through its policy um, sets the program capacity for a school and, um, and their policy is to keep uh, the, the capacity utilization within 10% of that uh, program capacity. So that target utilization zone is where we wanna see our enrollment numbers. If actual enrollment falls another 10% above or below that target utilization zone, then this bill would require the board to um, report to the, the General Assembly and the Howard County delegation to the General Assembly with a plan for addressing those, uh, those uh, 
capacity utilization issues and, and adjusting student enrollment to bring them back into their target utilization. If the actual enrollment exceeds or, or falls below the, the target utilization zone by more than 20%, then the board um, needs to assess whether it is uh, time to adjust the geographic attendance areas. Um, if they decide not to initiate a redetermination of geographic attendance areas, then they would report to the, the delegation and the General Assembly an explanation of um, you know, the, the reason that a redetermination was not considered appropriate and their plan to adjust student enrollments to meet the target utilization. Um, again, uh, the, the delegation did vote in support of this legislation, so I ask for your favorable report and happy to answer any questions. Outstanding, Delegate Phil Martin. Uh, members, are there any questions for Delegate Phil Martin? Seeing none, uh, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 1190. Uh, members, we are waiting on Delegate Acevedo for House Bill 1089. So if we can give him a moment and then we will hear 1089. But let me just say before he gets here, uh, there are 30 people signed up for this bill. Uh, so let's just be mindful of that uh, as we wait for Delegate Acevedo. Oh my God, okay. No worries. I really have 255 characters, so yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, am I able to make an announcement? Yes, uh, Delegate Patterson. Thank you very much. Just an announcement, a reminder to members of the Racing and Gaming Subcommittee. Uh, we will meet again tonight um, um, with the opportunity to have cast votes on some amendments. It is 6.30 uh, that will begin. It will be a members only um, meeting. That's a change from what was before. It's members only for the uh, <clears throat> Racing and Gaming Subcommittee on House Bill 940. Thank you. Thank you for that update, Delegate. Does anyone have Delegate Acevedo's cell phone number to give them a call? I actually do. He said he's en route, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Virtually en route. I would hope so. Sorry about the wait, Mr. Hartman. I know you like to be on time. I say, um, you know, not on time for a virtual hearing. We just 
done here. I think we could do without this bill. <laughs> let's let's take a vote now. Delegate Long isn't ready yet. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> It's 51 degrees outside. I'm going outside. See you. <laughs> yeah. yep. Hopefully we all can go shortly. Yeah. Can't wait to see bill. the sun. This is the last bill, isn't it? Yes. Did you say there were 30 speakers? That's correct. For or against? Uh, namely for. Really? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sarah, he's been called, um, and apparently he is on his way virtually. Okay, thank you, Haley. Mm -hmm. Must be a long walk. He's entering now. Okay, thank you. Delegate Astavero, uh, you're up for House Bill 1089. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, uh, Delegate Gabriel Astavero here to present uh, House Bill 1089, uh, the Police Free Schools Act. Um, Colleagues, uh, dismantling the school to prison pipeline is one of the most urgent challenges uh, in education. Uh, and oftentimes when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, absent from that conversation is the role that school police or SROs play in perpetuating the school to prison pipeline that in essence siphons black, Latinx, LGBTQ plus, uh, and students with disabilities from the classroom to the jailhouse for minor behavior, minor infractions, what we would expect from juveniles. According to the Maryland State Department of Education, nearly 70% of school-based arrests were for minor infractions. Uh, Black students bear a disproportionate share of this burden receiving 56% of school arrests despite making up just one third uh, of the student population. Now, in each of our respective counties, um, the data is broken down uh, even more. Uh, so for instance, uh, in for a fifth of enrollment in Montgomery County public schools, uh, but over half of all of its arrests. Uh, and as the statewide data showed, 
those arrests were for minor infractions. So for instance, disruption of school, uh, trespassing uh, to um, uh, uh, minor drug offenses, drug related offenses. Uh, and so this accounted for a majority of uh, the arrests that we saw in our schools. Uh, and what that does is those arrests traumatize students. Um, it causes them to miss school. Um, it forces them to navigate a complex legal system, um, but it also subjects uh, them to detention and family separation, increasing the likelihood that they will drop out of school. Um, Overcriminalization of children by school police is not the result of poor training or a few bad apples. The school resource model is flawed at its core. It does not have to be this way, however, colleagues, because there are proven solutions uh, that we can use in order to keep student and educators safe without causing harm. Now, let me just say that while I'm sympathetic to the emotional defenses of the SRO model, public policy and budget decisions must be grounded in data. And the data clearly show that the SRO model has not achieved its intended goal of making schools safer. Rather, what it has done, as I said earlier, is funneled Black, Latinx, LGBTQ+, and students with disabilities from the classroom to the jailhouse for minor behavior. These facts must drive policy decisions away from reliance on SROs and towards, stu and, and towards uh, uh, solutions that keep not some, but all of our kids safe. Colleagues, think about this, that when schools reopen, and we know uh, uh, all of us want to get there, uh, at some point where teachers are back to instruction, students are back in the classroom. But when our students head back to school, many of them will carry the trauma from the barrage of police violence against black people and people with disabilities, as well as loss, isolation, uh, economic hardship caused by this pandemic that many of our families will be reeling from. Rather than confronting them with school police, let us embrace all of our children with the support and services that they need that recognizes their basic humanity as children and not as criminals. SROs are police, not, uh, 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 not anything other than uh, police because it is a matter of law. Uh, they are armed, they have the authority to interrogate children, to uh, enforce law within schools, uh, and we really have to rethink school safety and what school safety looks like. House Bill 1089 is the beginning of that conversation about how we can reimagine school safety and really shift our focus on the proven solution based in evidence, not emotional defenses, but evidence, data proven solutions that would end the damaging and ineffective school police model wholesale by prohibiting school districts from contracting with police departments to station officers at schools. That is what House Bill 1089 would accomplish uh, when passed. Our children need counselors, social workers, restorative justice practitioners, uh, more nurses and behavioral specialists, not armed police. And with that colleagues, um, I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 1089 um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Delegate Acevedo. Are there any questions for Delegate Acevedo? Seeing none, our first uh, person in favor, uh, Anita Lampley. Oh, I did. Hello, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. My name is Anita Lampel. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, District 16. And this testimony is in support of HB 1089 in case the sign above my head didn't tell you that already. Um, this bill will bring us a step closer to the goal of justice, justice shall you pursue. That is part of our Jewish text. I lived in California where I served on many state and county commissions dealing with juvenile justice. I testified in juvenile court. I did evaluations on juveniles and I was on many advisory panels to my school district. When I moved to Montgomery County, 
home to one of the finest school systems in the country. I was told that it was very progressive and I was happy until I learned that it wasn't so progressive, until I learned that Maryland has the highest percentage of young black men in prison of any other state in the union, until I learned that Maryland's juvenile justice system is in, ranked in the bottom five for the United States. And school resource officers do nothing but contribute to these inequities. Your own Blue Ribbon panel stated in 2018 that school resource officers told us that they viewed arrests as a positive result of their work. Major studies have shown negative outcomes and no positive ones for a range of student success measures when SROs are on campus. And as Delegate Acevedo stated, this especially impacts Black students, Latinx students, students with individualized education plans. Um, and among these impacts, graduation rates and college attendance drop. Instead, there are programs that would um, serve students much better, counseling, trauma-informed interventions, crisis teams, restorative justice. These have a proven record of a long-lasting positive impact on students, this is a model that Toronto, Canada has adopted extremely successfully, and it is what students, parents, educators, and administrators want. Okay, so, look at it. Thank you. Jews United for Justice respectfully urges a favorable report on H Bill 1089. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gloria Merritt. Is Gloria Merritt here? Seeing that. Uh, next up, Porsche, Porsche uh, Vanderhorst. Good day, delegates. I'm Porsche Vanderhorst. I serve as an assistant principal in Montgomery County Public Schools, and I don't know for whom this testimony is meant, but I know someone is actively listening. Activist and organizer Sabina Virgil told this story. I was a guest at a fancy dinner banquet. The room was big and the tables had numbers on them so we know where to sit. During the dinner, a man sitting across from me was dissatisfied with his meal. He said that his food was cold. I was sitting on a different side and my dinner was hot. As this man kept talking, it struck me that it is impossible for people at the same table to agree of the temperature of the food. I realized that where you stand on an issue depends on where you are sitting. Where delegates are you sitting and where do you stand on this house bill? You have heard many stories about how police presence in schools cause trauma and have shown little evidence of making safer schools. When those truths are presented to you, how do you receive it? From where I'm sitting currently as an administrator, I stand in solidarity with our students who are asking for police to be removed from schools and want schools flooded with healers, flooded with counselors, culturally astute mediators, and people who can help staff unpack their beliefs about children. My students are majority students of color. They are in a school where there are no police. When they leave and go to high school, what they ask, what is wrong with me now that I now need police around me? Where I'm sitting from, I stand in solidarity with students who are able to envision a school thriving without police. I ask you to ask yourself, how did I get to this seat? Am I able to envision a school without police officers? From where I'm sitting as a black woman, I stand in solidarity with students who are bravely asking legislators and school systems to vote in ways that commit to their core values. When I think of police in schools, I cannot detach their presence from the history of policing and the current realities of policing in communities of color. Yes, I didn't do anything. You can mute your phone, Ms. Mary. Yes, I hear the testimonies of the meals that school officers have delivered or the mental health that they were able to hear from a student. And to that, I bravely respond, are police officers the only ones who can do that? Are they the ones who should do that? I ask, where do you sit on this truth? Do you prioritize the voices and comfort of those who are financially privileged or those who are largely unaffected by police? Do you legislate based on the desires of the unaffected 
or at the expense of the impacted. Sabrina Virgo added, where you stand on an issue depends not only where you're sitting, but if you are sitting. Our students are asking that those of you sitting in decision-making spaces pay attention to their labor, to them bearing the impact of police in their schools. They are serving you facts, experiences, details, and data. When those truths are served to you, how do you receive it? I don't know for which of you this testimony is for, but I hope that you hear that I am in support of House Bill 1089. Thank you. Good job, Ms. Vanderhorst. Uh, next up is Laura Payne. Lauren Payne. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Payne, and I am a senior at Richmond Montgomery High School in Rockville, Maryland. Thank you all for allowing me to take the time to testify today in favor of House Bill 1089, the Police Free Schools Act. Before I start, I asked you all to think about this one question. What does safety look like to you? If I know one thing, it's that if you're a student that looks like me, police and the word safety do not really go hand in hand. I want you all to really think about who these police officers are protecting, which students are benefiting from this inherently racist program, and which students are being left out to dry. But before I go into why I support this bill, I wanna give some context. Being from Montgomery County, a so-called progressive county in this overwhelmingly blue state, I'm shocked at the lack of awareness on issues such as policing. You see, this false sense of progressiveness allows Montgomery County to be content with inaction, and you can say the same exact thing for the state of Maryland. But this gives me all the more reason to support the Police Free Schools Bill. Instead of calling ourselves progressive, how about we actually pass progressive policy? How about we start doing the real work? Policing in our schools is just not an educational equity issue, but a racial equity issue. We can't continue to allow these inequities to run rampant in our schools and fund police, but not counselors and send our kids to jail instead of the classroom. Police in schools perpetuate the school to prison pipeline, an alarming and concerning reality when we think about how Maryland incarcerates more black boys and black men than any other state per capita. We quite literally are funneling our students out of schools and into prisons. I sit here today behind this computer screen urging you, the lawmakers, to set a precedent for what equity looks like throughout the state, to say that black and brown students matter. We need transformative justice instead of punitive justice. We need to stop the adultification of black youth and start treating them as true stakeholders of their own education, because education is where it starts. Under the Maryland Safe to Learn Act, we do not need police on school grounds. There are comprehensive alternative plans that can be put in place to nurture the mental, physical, and emotional well-being of our students across the states. Once we finally invest in students and address the root causes, we will begin to build a school system that is for all students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Gloria Merritt. Ms. Merritt. Hello. We hear you now. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah, hello. My name is Gloria Merritt, and I'm, I'm here to talk about the incident that occurred on September 6, 2019, with my son Jerome Liaison, who was injured at the hands of a Baltimore County police officer who had been assigned to Jerome's school. At the time of this incident, Jerome was 11 years old and was in the first year at General John Stricker Middle School. One thing you need to know about Jerome, he's autistic and has been diagnosed with autism since 2014. While he is very sweet, he's a very sweet boy. Part of, his, part of his condition means that he struggles with controlling his emotions and behavior. Jerome doesn't have the same social, psychological or emotional skills other children at the same age has. As a result of that, Jerome had been provided an IEP in order to address his special needs. On September 6, 2019, Jerome was being bullied by another student at General John Stricker. Jerome and the other boy was told they were going to be in trouble and was going to be taken to the principal's office. Jerome panicked and ran into an empty classroom where he felt safe. A, a, a staff member with the school went into the room after Jerome tried to remove him. The staff member then called the school resource officer, a police officer with the Baltimore County Police Department. 
with with the um the help the school with the help of the school resource officer, Jerome was physically taken from an empty classroom where he felt safe to a small, you know, he, he felt safe there. And then they took him to a small cramp room that looked like a, a prison cell. The staff member then held Jerome from behind and restrained him. Although Jerome was not resisting and was not posing a danger to himself or anyone else, the school resource officer decided to place Jerome in handcuffs. Once the handcuffs snapped onto Jerome's wrist, he became frantic. What happened after that was a struggle that lasted approximately 20 minutes of Jerome screaming in terror and trying to break free from the metal restraints. The more he struggled, the more pain he was in and the more he panicked. As a result of this altercation, Jerome suffered a fracture to one of the bones in his wrist. Even worse, Jerome has been psychologically and emotionally traumatized. Ever since the accident, Jerome has been terrified anytime he sees a police officer or security guard. There have been several occasions where I tried to take Jerome with me on errands to Walmart and supermarket. And when Jerome sees a security officer at the entrance, he refuses to get out the vehicle. He's afraid they're gonna hurt him again. Because Jerome was treated like a criminal instead of a, a fragile 11 year old artistic boy, he has suffered physically, emotionally, and psychologically and continues to bear consequences of the incident over a year and a half later. Ms. Merritt, your time is up. Can you uh, summarize your statement, please? Okay, um, you, you didn't hear my statement? I, I did, your time is up. If you can uh, come to a close. Okay, um, with that, uh, I wanna thank you for uh, listening to me and um, Hopefully we can get this matter resolved and get this bill passed. Thank you so much. Last person for this group is uh, Tori Grace. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tori Grace and I am chair of YAR also, mm, Youth as Resources, also known as YAR's Board of Directors. I am 19 years old and um. I'm a former student of Baltimore City Public School System. Uh, so YAR is a youth-led grant-making community organizing and leadership development organization. We have been working around school police accountability since 2015, and Youth as Resources is now in support of House Bill 1089 to remove school police from Baltimore City schools, I mean, from Baltimore City and Maryland schools. Um, our board of directors came to this decision because we are young people and we decided to learn more about where our peers stood on this issue to make an informed, informed decision around this. We administered a student survey. We received 99 responses and facilitated seven focus groups, five focus groups with 75 of our peers, I'm sorry, <laughs> via Zoom. Uh, we asked for feedback around removing school police in an unbiased way, meaning we didn't come in with any um, any opinions, arguments, or data. And although we continue to be concerned that students, um, including us, do not always feel safe, we found significant support for removing school police from schools. About 60% felt that school police should be removed from schools, while 20% were not sure. And even among the um, minority of students who felt that school police should be in schools, most wanted major changes such as having school, pol school police not be in uniform or having them not be involved in fights or conflict. Um, although over the years we've gotten specific feedback on positive experiences with school police officers in Baltimore City and student report relationships with school police is um, more positive than their relationship with police outside um, with Baltimore City public, mm, Baltimore City Police Department officers, um, too many students still report that they believe officers use um, excessive force and force that isn't appropriate to the situation. Um, so this increases the conflict that like happens more than it diffuses it. 
Uh, furthermore, we are not adults on the streets, so students behave, student behavior should not be criminalized. Uh, school police involvement has the potential to create an opportunity for students to get involved in the justice system. Um, and finally, I wanted to talk about some of the suggestions that our peers had instead of having school police, which are security staff to replace school police, including hall monitors, mental health counselors, increased programs and staff to address school climate, trauma, stress and wellness, safe spaces in school where Thank students- Ms. Grace, help. Your, your time is up. If you can uh, close out for me. Okay. <laughs> and peer-to-peer -peer programming. Thank you for your time. Uh, but this is why YAR uses resources supports House Bill 1089. You did a good job too. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, members, are, are there any questions for this group? Seeing none, uh, next up is uh, uh, Nia Signal. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Neha Singhal. I oh. am a Montgomery County teacher, um, high school teacher in Montgomery County, testifying today as an individual in support of Bill 1089. I can tell you firsthand from witnessing a student being arrested in school and the negative impact it had on that student, their family, and their peers, that having police in schools is not developmentally appropriate. When police are involved, obviously things get escalated, which means that young people are not given the chances they need and deserve to practice conflict management skills. Policing is and always will be a punitive measure serving the interests of a criminal injustice system rather than the needs of a developing mind. Moreover, we also know that SRO involvement isn't always about students' actions but instead about unwarranted adult fears steeped in systemic racism, which lead to disproportionate surveillance and arrests based on things like race and disability. Take for example, the case just last year in Montgomery County, where a five-year-old child walked out of school and rather than having trauma-informed trained educators going to look for him and get him to safety, the police were called who acted in line with their job, which was to see the situation as a criminal act. This child was traumatized for almost one hour as police told him things like, you should be beaten. You might think that this is an isolated incident that only happened because these were quote unquote beat cops and not SROs, but this myth that SROs are mentors is easily debunked if you take the time to listen, actually listen to black and brown students who have been testifying for months about their stories of being racially profiled, tased, cursed at, and harmed by SROs in schools the very same way that beat cops did to that five-year-old black child and many others. It's impossible for SROs who are again, armed police officers to be mentors when their job is to enforce the law, which means they end up viewing normal childhood behavior through the lens of the legal system. Several studies have already proven that implicit bias trainings for police do not work in decreasing disparity. Therefore, the only solution remaining is to remove the SROs. In addition to SRO removal, we need your help in strengthening our professional ability as students, as school staff, to proactively address and resolve conflict by voting to support funding for more mental health services, counselors, and restorative justice training. Because I am trained in restorative practices, there have been many times where I was able to address conflict without having to get police involved and making it a legal matter for no reason. I wanna end by noting that I am just one of 200 teachers, counselors, and administrators in Montgomery County who have signed a letter to elevate our students' concerns about the SRO program, and we echo their call for removal. All of us educators did not take this issue lightly when signing onto the letter, but believe strongly in heeding the call when young people are sounding the alarm that something is deeply unjust. Please delegates, allow us educators to do our jobs and support a child's journey to learning healthy behaviors without the involvement of police. Please vote favorably on 1089. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Timothy Williams. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, committee. My name is Timothy Williams, and I've been a, a high school teacher at Northwestern High School uh, for eight years now. And, um, you know, as a Black man, I'm just disgusted at the many instances of police brutality I see in Prince George's County and at the nation as a whole. Uh, when I see uh, statistics like uh, it says during the, uh, the 2018 
2019 school year, 61% of the student arrests were for nonviolent offenses. So that lets me know that that system, that our current system is not working um, for black and brown kids. Um, they're being traumatized and they're being unfairly, um, you know, um, persecuted by the system. Um, uh, one argument that you always hear about keeping SROs is about the mentorship. And as someone who's in the school every single day, I'm a teacher, I have positive um, and nurturing relationships with students, but I don't necessarily need um, a rest in powers to have that. Um, someone at, who was at our school who recently passed of COVID, he was a, um, he was a coach, uh, Terrence um, Burke. He was a, a school coach. He was loved. He's very beloved by the students. I have an actual student uh, of mine in, in my, he's in my class now, um, but he was, he's still loved and respected, but he never needed um, arresting powers to cultivate that relationship. Uh, someone right across the hall from me is a, a peer mediator. And he, he resolved so many conflicts, so many conflicts in, the, in our school building without um, the use of police. Okay, or him, he doesn't need arrest and power. So um, I see, you know, so while I am sensitive to the fact that, you know, some kids may get some mentoring from SROs, you don't necessarily, you can be a mentor without necessarily um, having arrest and powers. Okay. Um, and yeah, I just echo what I've already heard here, like what, what I've heard of students have reported to me. Um, them being um, harassed by police officers, um, profiled. Um, and then even when we see things on TV, because our students, they, they watch the news as well. You know, we see the Prince George's Police um, Department, they even had racial, dis um, alleged racial discrimination in their own department. So when we say safety, we got to, um, you know, safety, it can't come at the expense of justice. You know, it can't be on the backs of black and brown um, students and pretty much, you um, cutting off their ability to um, be employed in the future, uh, go to college or the military. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's all I had to say. Yeah, so, so I'm in favor, I'm in favor of HB um, 1089, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, Brocky Cajun. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Brookie Chajan. I am a Maryland resident speaking against the 1089 bill. I graduated Northwestern High School in Prince George's County in 2009. I began my education there shortly after my brother Randy was killed by MS-13. At the time I met my SRO, Michael Rudensky. He was asked by the federal government to keep me safe and out of trouble. That is exactly what he did for me. My SRO impacted my life in such a positive way. He helped me see my problems differently. And more importantly, he helped me stay out of trouble in school. He treated me and all his students as his own. I remember one time a friend of mine, which was also a student from Northwestern High School, was raped in the middle of the night. And the first person that came to my mind to call was my SRO, Michael Rodensky. He will always do more than his job required him to do even if it meant working after hours. I would not have uh, graduated my uh, high school or probably something would have happened to me if it wasn't for him, my SRO. My SRO always went for a different approach and not just so quickly to arrest a problem child. Sometimes we just need to hear it from someone else other than our parents. A lot of students can agree with me that even though sometimes we didn't like the SRO, we knew he was keeping us safe in school. Now I have two beautiful children who will grow up in Maryland. And I know the danger of being a young person in the state and the challenges young people face. I would not feel comfortable sending my babies to school in Maryland without our SRO present. Please, pa please don't pass 1089. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Michelle Hall. Thank you and good afternoon and thank you all for having me here today. My name is Michelle Hall and I'm here testifying on behalf of the Office of the Public Defender in support of Delegate Acevedo's Police Free Schools Act. I'm here because my career is dedicated to representing young people in juvenile court and adult court and in appeals. And I hope to never represent again a child in a school-based offense. 
I won't belabor the national or local data and makes abundantly clear how the presence of SROs feeds the school to prison pipeline that has been adequately briefed and others have spoken to it today. I will say first that police and schools do not exist in a vacuum and Mr. Williams started to touch on this point. But the same concerns that many share about excessive force and the need for police reform are present when we consider school policing because these same officers come from the same troubled police departments where officers receive the same training in law enforcement and use of force that they deem fit. You can just take a look at what is happening in my county, Prince George's, and you can see how the police department is riddled with excessive use of force against black and brown citizens. The notion that officers coming from the same department are equipped after just 40 hours to provide a safe and secure environment for our primarily black and brown students to thrive and learn is incompatible with the growing public evidence of excessive force by that police department and many others. Regardless of their misleading name, the role of a school resource officer is to act as law enforcement and to be an armed police officer in schools because they are trained and employed as such. Though many individual school resource officers may have been lauded for being important mentors, coaches, and role models, the truth is that at their core, they are at schools to be armed police officers first and foremost. We saw this most clearly in a very recent Court of Appeals case, the highest court in Maryland, SK, where a high school girl went to her school resource officer in tears because there were videos of her being circulated around school engaged in sexual activity. And at the end of that conversation, that school resource officer filled out charges based on her statements for her to be prosecuted for distribution of child pornography. This case is one of many examples of how school resource officers can never shed their identity as law enforcement, regardless of how much they may want to be mentors, coaches, and role models. I have represented too many children in school fights that could have been resolved through mediation between the two children. I've represented too many children in what are called robberies, which is oftentimes a push in taking a $20 bill, which could be resolved through restorative justice circles. I've represented too many children charged with trespassing at school because of a lack of programming during the summer and after school. I've represented children whose case came to the Department of Juvenile Services, not because the child was arrested that day and was dangerous, but as a matter of a school resource officer emptying, emptying out a file cabinet at the end of the school year and sending over those incident reports um, in that drawer. Children are being subjected to prosecution because of paperwork and the consequences that I see every day are devastating to a child's development and sense of self. Anytime a child is in juvenile court, they miss school for hearings, falling behind in their education, their parents miss work, um, leading to serious financial consequences. They can be placed on electronic monitoring and detained and taken out of their homes. Children are growing and learning how to cope with complicated emotions. And that is true for all of us. But having police officers in schools does not make our schools safer. It criminalizes our children and I urge you all to support this bill today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Uh, Monisha? Hello, I'm Monisha Terrell. I'm with the Public Justice Center. We're one of over 90 members of the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability. The PJC and MCJPA support House Bill 1089. You've heard today, you'll continue to hear and you heard last month about how the school police model isn't working for students, parents, and educators throughout the state. It's not keeping kids safe. It's subjecting kids to arrest for minor childhood and disability related mistakes. It's inflicting physical and emotional trauma to students, particularly acutely for students of color and students with disabilities. What I'll focus on is why we need state level legislation to reimagine school safety, to get police out of our classrooms and invest in measures that truly protect all children. First, Maryland law is in large part responsible for putting many of our police in our schools. Each year we spend 10 million state dollars on this model. Every district automatically gets a slice of this mandated funding and thus has a powerful incentive to rely on school police without analyzing whether the program works and whether it does more harm than good. Second, in Baltimore City, the school police force is a creation of state statute and the only way to dismantle it is to repeal that state law. Finally, and most fundamentally, Questions of student behavior and school safety have always been a state issue. We have state law banning corporal punishment, prohibiting most suspensions of students in grades K through two, limiting restraint and seclusion, and requiring the use of positive behavior interventions and supports just by way of example. The General Assembly enacted these state requirements and prohibitions because they reflect good policy supported by data. And the same is true here. 40 years of research Detailed in our written testimony, the testimony of Marylanders to prevent gun violence and others, tells us that police presence in schools does not improve school safety. It does not prevent school shootings or reduce 
any type of school-based violence. Just last month, two weeks ago, a study in JAMA found that armed officer presence was actually associated with a threefold increase in the number of deaths resulting from a school shooting. And the evidence is equally clear that the harms resulting from the model aren't isolated. They're systemic and statewide. Across the state, 70% of school-based arrests are for shoving matches, disruption, similarly low-level offenses. Across the state, Black students and students with disabilities are facing school-based arrest at grossly disproportionate rates, in part because we concentrate officers in schools with more Black students, and because, as you heard from Ms. Merritt, we arrest students because of behavior arising from their disabilities. And beyond arrest, officer presence in schools has been shown to increase suspensions, decrease test scores, and graduation rates among students of color. By contrast, trauma-informed practices, social-emotional learning, restorative justice have been shown to prevent student behavior crises, decrease aggressive conduct, and strengthen student educator relationships, improving school safety for everybody. This isn't about bad people. It's not about bad training. It's about a model that doesn't fit the education setting because by design, it uses law enforcement to respond to the behaviors kids engage in because their brains are developing and they're it's figuring out how to resolve conflifts and handle their emotions. Yeah, can and, you can summarize for me, please. Sure. Um, so uh, in, in summary, an SRO who arrests a child for disruption, she isn't a bad cop. She's a, a cop doing her basic job, which is to view and respond to conduct yeah. through the lens of the code. The committee has a history of developing state education policy based on the evidence. And here it's Rev, can you give me one word, one line. The uh, evidence supports enactment of House Bill 1089. Thank you so much. Uh, members, are there any questions for this group? We have uh, three more in favor. Uh, Daryl Frazier. He's not uh, here. Frazier is not here. Uh, Mia Donos. She's not here. She's not here either. And Michaela uh, Wilkes. Hello, um, thank you for allowing me to be here today. My name is Michaela Wilkes and I am uh, the co-founder and executive director of an organization called Schools Not Jails. And what we do is we work to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. And so today I'm here, not only as a parent of an elementary school child um, in Charles County in which his elementary school has an SRO, but I'm here as someone who was funneled through the school to prison pipeline myself. And so I have firsthand experience of how school resource officers impact the lives of students. And I think that it's important to point out that we are talking about children and we're talking about their safety. And these same police officers that are in our schools are the same police officers that are out on the streets, um, the same police officers that are in these police departments, um, um, you know, that we're saying needs to be reformed. And so if, if, if our police departments need to be reformed, um, then why do we feel safe with them in the classroom or in the hallways with our children? And I think it's also important to point out when we look at the opposition um, to House Bill 1089, and we hear the stories of the, of the, the so-called good apples, and we hear the stories of the school resource officers who act as mentors. I've been there before. Um, and, and, and dealing with those kind of SROs, it wasn't so much of, of, of a mentorship as much as it was intimidation, um, you know, telling us stories, you know, horror stories about what can happen and how you can go to jail. And so it's not really getting down to the root causes. But even so with those good apples um, who have positively impacted the lives of students, it's important to note that they are impacting the lives of students in a capacity that of someone who is trained in crisis intervention, someone who's trained in trauma-informed practices, someone who is trained in mental health services. And so that's where we can create a just transition for those good apples. Um, to act in that capacity. And it's important to note that removing SROs from schools is not about the individual. It is about the system because the system itself is not working. The system is incarcerating black and brown children at alarming rates um, in, in, in disparities, not county to county, but throughout the entire state, which is why it's important that this bill be passed throughout the entire state of Maryland, because the disparity is seen 
all across the board, regardless of which district you're in, regardless of which county you're in, the disparity is there. And so if we really care about our children and we really care about black and brown lives, then the right decision to make is to pass House Bill 1089 and invest in actual resources for our children and to start taking restorative and holistic approaches to making sure that our children are safe. Because what's happening right now is the school resource officer program is not doing what it was intended to do. It's hurting black and brown children and children that require special needs. And so I implore um, everyone on this call to take a look within yourselves and take a look at what's happening, not only in our country, but in our state, right in our own backyard and pass House Bill 1089 and invest in the actual safety of our children and not in- Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, great job. Uh, members, any questions for Ms. Wilkes as she is the last favorable? Next up is a group of unfavorable, starting with um, Jason Neely. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. My name is Jason Knighting. I'm a 23 year law enforcement officer, uh, veteran and school resource officer for the last five years. I come to you with over 200 hours of specialized training in school-based policing. My family and I reside in the area I serve. I'm opposing Bill 1089. Traditionally, Maryland allows school systems to decide what is best for them in these matters. If this bill is passed at the state level, it would limit the flexibility of school systems to provide for their unique needs. I've heard testimony that SROs build relationships with students, parents, and staff and open, on open dialogue uh, of fairness, regardless of race, gender, creed, sexual orientation, academic and economic status. In 2018, the Safe to Learn Act was legislated. For the first time, Maryland defined SROs, their roles, responsibilities, and 40 hours of training, including de-escalation, disability awareness, and special attention to cultural fluency, maintaining a positive school climate, constructive interaction with students, implicit bias, and disability and diversity awareness with specific attention to racial disparities. Maryland is now a leader in school training of SROs and the public. You have heard many perceptions about arrest numbers that occurred in public schools in 2018. These opinions are valid. Obviously, we do not want any arrest of students in public schools. The related data is not easily obtainable or made transparent. I submitted a FOIA request to all local school systems and obtained related data, and I have started forwarding it to you guys. In one of our largest school systems, there were 311 arrests. However, there were thousands of arrestable incidents that our SROs and security personnel mitigated otherwise. In the local school system I'm talking about, in 2018, there were 698 drug offenses, 256 attacks on adults, 1,437 attacks on students, 3,290 3, fights, nine explosives confiscated, and set, uh, 10 sexual attacks. In one of the smallest school systems, there were 71 attacks on adults, 440 attacks on students, 266 fights, and 2,080 disruptions over the same time period with 14 arrests. If you read the documents I sent you, I believe you will find empirical evidence to demonstrate the need for SROs and security in our public schools. They are providing alternate solutions rather depending on arrest or referral. Every individual student's feelings or perceptions must be validated. In addition to some young people having trauma from seeing a uniformed police officer, there's also a large number of students that fear coming to school because of the threat of violence or mass casualty. The passing of 1089 could further trauma the students in this category. House Bill 1187, if passed, would allow SROs and school security to do their job without putting school uh, students into the school to prison pipeline, and it would ease concerns that many of your constituents have. In closing, I would recommend the state continue to allow local school systems to make their own decisions concerning these matters. Maryland is diverse with many cultures, practices, and traditions that are different from region to region. We should recognize that can, uh, close out for me. Yes, sir. We should recognize it works in Maryland on uh, in Central Maryland may not work on the Eastern Shore. Again, I oppose Bill 1089. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Cerise King. Ms. King? Yes. I, not here. Uh, Cherie Walden. I'm right here. All right. Sorry. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Sincere King. I'm a senior at Aberdeen High School in Hartford County. 
I am before you today in a pup in a pop a position of any legislation that would remove or affect how school resource officers engage with students in our schools. This is my story. As I began my eighth grade year at Aberdeen Middle School, I was already in a downward spiral due to family death. My, fam my friends and I became victim to racist comments from a group of Caucasian students who recalled very racist words that exist probably several times a day. Um, there were heated verbal and physical exchanges this went on for several months. On both of the sides, students were suspended through this ordeal. On February 1st, 2017, I changed clothes and went into what I called my fighting boots. I was ready to physically fight one of the students from an incident the prior day. As I was walking to my bus, this group was chanting the N-word, thankfully, but my SRO um, caught me before I could get into any little trouble. I was walking down the hallway when I saw a student who had called my mom the B word, the same one who threatened to physically fight me in school. I became increasingly angry to the point that I threw a bottle of water at his face, which led to physical altercation. As a result of my actions, we were both suspended, but also referred to juvenile services by our SRO. Every student involved in this racial conflict had met prior with the assistant principal and our SRO. We were advised that any further altercations would result in suspension and referral to juvenile services. Prior to this, we have been counseled, attempted me mediation, and other means to resolve this issue that failed. How did my life change? Well, my life changed when my SRO took me under his wing and basically gave me an outlet. He let me talk to him. He took me under his wing just as a kid. Their SROs are more than just somebody who's just in our schools. They impact our life. They keep us safe. If it wasn't for my SRO, I would have got hurt. A lot of my other kids in my school would have got hurt. It would have just led to a very bad incident. So he allowed the students to vent with him, right? He is an inspiration to me and his great friend. As He is an inspiration to me and one of my greatest mentors. I was disappointed in being referred to juvenile services. However, being referred by him made me change my ways. It made me get a hobby. It made me live my life. I'm getting ready to graduate because of my SRO. If it wasn't for my SRO, I wouldn't have made it to where I am now, getting ready to graduate in one month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Sheree uh, Walden. She's not here. Uh, Michael Radunsky. Christopher Berry. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Michael is here. Then you, uh, Mr. Berry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, hello, first of all, thank you to all of our students on either side of this issue. I applaud you for being here and taking part of your community. Members of the committee, my name is Mike Rudensky and I'm here to testify in my capacity as a board member of the Maryland Association of School Resource Officers and not in my capacity as a state employee. I have 34 years law enforcement experience, 17 as an SRO. I've trained thousands of SROs nationally. My wife and I have no children, my children, were those in the school where I was assigned. 1089 should not be passed. We would eliminate SROs in favor of counselors. That's ridiculous. The schools need both. It takes a village to raise our children. The removal of SROs will work against reducing the school to prison pipeline. The SRO is a specially trained officer assigned to provide resources and alternatives to arrest for delinquent behaviors. SROs are trained how not to arrest as a resolution. Before the 2018 Safe to Learn Act, SROs were not defined in Maryland. Training was not required. Any data prior to the STLO, STLA mandates is antiquated. Measurement of any data since the mandate is impossible because of COVID. We've heard testimony that there's no proof that SROs prevent school shootings or make schools safe. That's a fact. It's also a fact that there is no evidence that they do not prevent school shootings or make schools safer. The data on those topics has never been aggregated. The SRO's job is more than a police officer, a mentor, a relationship builder, and in today's world, administrators are not equipped 
to handle incidents like human trafficking from parents, peers, or outsiders, active threats, gangs, sexual exploitation, internet crimes, or extreme violence. In Maryland schools, these things happen every day. All will require police officers to be called. Without SROs, you will get adequate coverage police officers. That's a patrol officer with no special training. The $10 million funding to hire counselors rather than supplement law enforcement agencies makes no sense. The funds have to be distributed to local school systems and schools with 1,400 that leaves less than $10,000 per school. Will that pay for a counselor? We can do better than this bill. We can provide for counselors and mental health resources for children. We can add more training. We can add more citizen involvement in the process to assign SROs. And we can rid departments of policies that require SROs to forego discretion and arrest upon a demand of a parent. In closing, I'd like to add that on Monday, the first day of returning to school, a school shooting occurred in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. That evening, the SRO who I had the privilege to train sent a message. The message was, I haven't said anything publicly, nor have I talked about it to other officers, but being SROs, I know you guys can feel my pain. They took me out of the school a few weeks ago because patrol was short today. We had a shooting, I am broken. I should have been there. Please don't pass 1089 and keep Maryland schools safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Sheree Walden. Good afternoon. My name is Sire Walden. I'm a student. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Sire Walden. I am a student in the Hartford County Public School System. I'm here today to testify that we need our school resource officers. Keep our SROs. I'm disappointed there's a legislation to remove SROs and hinder what they do in our schools. These bills appear to be introduced by legislators from a few counties where very serious delinquent acts are occurring. This is said that you're trying to cut SROs from 23 counties instead of focusing and on the issues and making modifications and requiring more training and mandating some sort of matrix for arrest or referral of juveniles to juvenile services. Keep our SROs. There's no doubt we could use more counselors in our schools, however, not at the expense of safety and order. The response time for an officer who is called to the school will largely increase. You'll get an officer that is not trained to work with juveniles. This will likely turn out poorly in all, for all involved. Keep our SROs. SROs, if properly trained, can be a great resource to our school community, not just students, our parents. I know I can trust my SRO and I respect him. He trusts me and respects me. SROs work hard to bridge the gap Aside from being a good role model, SROs are mentors, educators, and really do make a difference just by being themselves. Keep our SROs. I would like to suggest to Senate and House of Representative members, you do not permit this legislation to succeed. SROs have come a long way since their inception, and, will not, and while not perfect, none of us are. The current training can be expanded to meet the needs of the community. Reach out to the trainers, offer recommendations, enact laws that provide resources to the police as a, as a whole and school administrators get to get juveniles assistance or programs when they have committed a delinquent act versus arrest. In closing, my middle school's motto is to soar, seek excellence, overcome obstacles, accept responsibilities, and respect self and others. We even as juveniles need to accept responsibilities and it starts with respecting ourselves. Do not divide our communities, keep our seat, SROs. Uh, hold on. Uh, class, you thank, thank you so much. Uh, Next up, Christopher Berry. 
Thank you very much, Delegate Barnes. Um, <clears throat> my name is Christopher Berry. I am a principal at high school here in Maryland. I have worked in two different systems in the state of Maryland and have been an administrator for 19 years and have served three different high schools in that capacity. The views that I present here today are not of my uh, employer, but are my own. I speak in opposition to House Bill 1089. We all seek justice in our world. We all seek good experiences for our students. In, the, in my time in service, I recognize that there are places as I travel the state where the SRO program does not work and needs serious reform. This is why the previous reform bills have been passed and need time to be put in place. I echo the previous thoughts of Mr. Radinsky and the facts that he presents in terms of timelines and reminding us that our SRO program is a work in progress. In recognizing that there are places where the SRO program doesn't work, it also requires that we remember that there are many places where they do. Many places in these states where these uniformed officers are integral members of our school communities. They work daily to build trust, they teach, they are ever present and positive role models. In an age when we need our police to be seen as role models and serve in community policing situations, to take them away from this ability, to take away the teachable moments of our children, to see them as positive, productive members of our community is not what we should seek to do. In looking at our SRO pro program in, this, in the communities that I have served, they have been an outstanding example of working proactively with students. They head off so many examples of conflict in our school and prevent things that never occur because of their presence. And I would suggest to you that many of the things they head off, they do in part because they are police officers, something that counselors and people in certain situations would not have the ability to do. They, are, they participate in restorative circles. They do wellness checks in situations where only police officers can do wellness checks. Just last week, a student at my school was involved in a domestic dispute. The police arrived at the school, at his home. They began confronting him and he became quite agitated. By sheer luck, our school resource officer, who he knew, showed up and he literally looked into his eyes and said, thank God you are here to the SRO that he was familiar with every day. I would close by saying this, House Bill 1089 presents a false choice. This is not an either or situation as Mr. Radinsky just said, but from a school administrator perspective, I can tell you we need both SROs and counselors and those who can work with our students in proactive ways. Please don't see this as a false choice. We need to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need SROs in our schools. I encourage you to look at other bills that rethink the guidelines and look at those areas where SROs are not being successful and bring reforms to those areas versus this heavy handed bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Shore. Sure. Hello? Yes, sir. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, committee members, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Christopher Shore, and I'm here to speak with you about House Bill 1089, the Police Free School Act, which would eliminate school resource officers and replace them with counselors, unarmed people who would be unable to respond to emergency situations like the one that I experienced as a high school student in San Diego, California. On March 22nd, 2001, Jason Hoffman brought a shotgun and a pistol to Granite Hills High School. Hoffman fired his shotgun at his vice principal and then indiscriminately into the quad, wounding three students and two teachers. At the time of the shooting, my mother and sister were in a nearby classroom. So together, half my family, along with the rest of their class, hid under their desks while their windows were pelted with buckshot. Hoffman failed to kill anyone that day Indeed, he never had the opportunity to access his second weapon after expending his shotgun ammo. And this is because he was stopped. He was shot by our school resource officer. 
Only three weeks earlier, a shooting at a neighboring school had left two students dead and 13 injured. Santana High School did not have a school resource officer, and consequently, the shooter, Andy Williams, was able to reload his revolver three times before he was stopped. Years later, I briefly worked as a campus supervisor. On several occasions where I was present, I observed our school resource officer responding to crises in ways that I and other campus supervisors could not. On one such occasion, our SRO detained and searched a student reported to have brought a firearm to campus. Uh, without an SRO present, the school would have had to risk the lives of unarmed and unbody armored staff members. Alternatively, it could have risked the lives of its students and faculty by simply calling the police and waiting. Recall that Andy Williams was able to reload his firearm three times and kill two children before he was stopped. On another occasion, a staff member had received threats to her life from her recently released mentally disturbed and violent ex-husband. I believe that having a school resource officer and police cruiser visibly present that day may have deterred the attack. San Diego schools are not uniquely dangerous. School shootings can happen anywhere and school resource officers are our best line of defense against them. So I ask that you help to protect the lives of Maryland students, faculty, and staff by voting no on the Police Free School Act. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Delegate Holmberger, do you still have a question? You're on mute. The, the gentleman that I wanted to ask the question to, I don't see him on the screen any longer. But um, I had to do have his email address and I can just email him directly. About the data that he All right. Are there any other questions for this group here? Thank you. Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, Christopher Christopher Farley. Is Christopher yeah. Farley? Yes. Can uh, you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Thank you, distinguished members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Christopher Fraley. I am testifying against House Bill 1089. I have served as an SRO in the states of Maryland and West Virginia for over 14 years. I've also served for the past five years as the National Association of School Resource Officers Region 2 Director, which includes Kentucky, Maryland, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. The benefits of school-based policing must be understood by your committee and the state before any legislation is considered to remove the entire profession. The students of our state need full wraparound services, which should include positive school-based law enforcement. The mere presence of law enforcement is not a form of intimidation. It should be one of many safety and security elements, I'm sorry, within a school. The removal or restriction of SROs from serving as safety partners in the school environment would increase the risk of school violence and decrease the opportunities for law enforcement to build positive relationships with our youth and to educate and informally counsel students about public safety and law related matters. I would be remiss if I did not address the obvious. Could there be officers that are assigned as SROs that should not be? Of course, that is possible. However, with the Maryland Safe to Learn Act of 2018, you put many safeguards in place to ensure the most qualified officers are available for selection. To pass legislation that removes an entire profession is unfair to the students and families of Maryland. We're not your average police officers. We are trained in restorative practices and mental health counseling processes. We are within the school buildings as a confidant for students, a resource for administrators, and often the only good authority figure that many students see. I say to every student that I encounter, I am not here to arrest you. I am here to be your friend. I am here to listen to you and help you work through what is happening in your life to get to the other side of it. I understand from watching previous testimony that some fear that the mere existence of SROs will increase the volume of students placed in the school to prison pipeline. I strongly disagree with this assessment. The data collected by the state is missing the number of interactions between students and SROs that do not end in the rest of a student. You can read my written testimony for some data collected showing that the percent of arrests to the percent of incidents of local district students is highly different. 
Across the nation, NASRO has found that communities which adhere to the best practices for school-based law enforcement overwhelmingly indicate satisfaction with their SRO programs. We believe that all communities, including those with significant policing issues, can have the same experience through reform versus discontinuation of SRO programs. Thank you for your time today. I am available for questions at any time and I can provide further insight into how other region two states utilize school-based law enforcement for the betterment of their states and their local communities. And I strongly urge you to vote no on House Bill 1089. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fraley. Uh, Delegate Barnes, I've returned. Uh, thank you for uh, doing such an excellent job uh, while I was uh, on a meeting and picking up my daughter at daycare. Uh, we'll now go next to uh, Mr. Clyde Boatwright. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the uh, Ways and Means Committee. My name is Clyde Boatwright, and I'm the president of the Maryland State Fraternal Order of Police, representing over 20,000 active and retired police officers throughout the state of Maryland. I also have the distinct honor of being the local president of the Baltimore City School Police Force. I am a 20-year law enforcement veteran, with the last 18 years um, spent as a school police officer in the city of Baltimore. Um, in most counties, uh, that is referred to as an SRO. Our police department was founded in 1967, and some of this data is included in a written testimony already submitted before you. Um, but our motto is protecting our future, and that is what our job is as a Baltimore City School Police Officer. By passing this piece of legislation, you will um, abolish a police department with a long standing history of working within our community. Let me give you a, a look back into the changes of our police department. Back in 2017, uh, what's well, actually, I'll do, go a little further back. Back in 2016, yeah, 15, our officers were removed from schools in a pilot program because our officers were essentially not able to carry firearms. So we were removed from schools and put in a micro zone system, which required our police officers to only respond inside of the schools when called by an administrator. Um, that saw assaults in the building um, increase to over 1000 assaults in, in our Baltimore city schools. Um, it forced um, the local unions to get together and, um, and come up with a plan about re returning our officers to schools. Um, so I'll give you an, another example of how this process has worked. Um, with all of the large number of assaults, the Baltimore City Teachers Union in 2000, uh, December of 2018 commissioned a school safety task force to which I participated. Ironically enough, 56 days later, on February 8th of 2019, we had a, a staff member shot in one of our high schools. When we talk about reimagining policing, it is hard uh, to not think about the days of February 8th of 2019. It is hard to not think about the days of November 24th of two, 2015 when we had a student killed at Renaissance Academy by another student, or November 21st, 2008, where we had another student uh, uh, stabbed and killed um, at the Lamel Middle School. The one thing that was consistent in all three of these cases, it was a Baltimore City school police officer's handcuffs that went on the suspect and took them to justice. So that is our role. Our role in, is to protect our future. And we understand that there are some problems within policing and we're not tone deaf. As you can see, I am one of those black and brown children that went through a Baltimore City public school as a student. And I'm here to, to, to tell you that as a father of a 14 year old, I would love to see the SRO program continue in the state of Maryland. And I'll stand for any questions from anyone of the panel. All right, well, Mr. Boatwright, I think there's even current students as I heard in the Prince George's, Prince George's County School Board meeting the other night saying the majority of students would like to keep their SROs. Uh, so even, even the current students have said that. Uh, Mr. Daniel Petz uh, from uh, City of Havard, Grace. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Dan Petz. I'm a sergeant with the Habit of Grace Police Department, and um, I was an SRO and an SRO supervisor, and I'm asking everyone if they could vote uh, no to House Bill 1089. Um, this bill would be devastating in the city of Habit of Grace. We have SROs in our uh, elementary, middle, and high schools. The program is loved by our community, the staff, and the children. There's no data that could show 
how much the children and the staff and the community like the program, but you would immediately know if they didn't because they would be going to uh, the chief and saying that she, they don't want the police in schools. Um, our officers are not in the school to make arrests. Uh, they're in the schools to protect the children and the staff. They're there. We are there to build relationships. I've heard restorative practices used over and over. When I was an SRO six years ago, I was using these practices then before it was a hot word where we were mediating with children. I was calling parents when kids were fighting and having them come in, talking it out, and there was never an issue. So these were children who would never even get referred to juvenile services because the problem was taken care of well before it ever happened. Um, just in closing, in the city of Havity Grace, we've, the programs that we've put into these schools have um, went over to after school activities such as safety clubs. In the summertime, we run uh, a safety camp for weeks. We always have a waiting list on that. We're getting so many people interested in it that we can't even accommodate it. We don't even have the ability to do that. And um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the city of Havity Grace is funding this. It's not um, the county school system. But if this bill were to pass, I would um, ask that they make um, a change where it would, it would actually go to the county school systems to make the decision if they want police in the schools or not. Because I feel like um, maybe what's happening in one part of the state doesn't meet what's happening in another part of the state. And it, like, I'm saddened to hear a lot of what's going on because I never saw that. The whole time that I was in the schools, it was an excellent experience. I loved my school. I was not doing anything through intimidation. I live in the city that I work in. My children go to schools here. I'm happy every day that there's a police officer in that building with them. And uh, I just, I hope that you take all that into account when you all make your decision today. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm also here for questions. Thank you, uh, Officer Pitts. Uh, we next have uh, Drew Jabin with the Maryland Association of Counties. Ms. Jabin? She's not here. Not here. Okay, um, one more, Scott Adams. Hello, but good afternoon. It's still afternoon, right? That is. Good, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of, of the committee. I'm Sheriff Scott Adams of Cecil County. And uh, I'm here testifying today on behalf of myself and also for the Maryland Sheriff's Association, who has submitted written testimony in opposition of this bill. I, I have a unique perspective on the topic of SROs, as I was an SRO and later an SRO supervisor for 18 years um, as part of my career with the Cecil County Sheriff's Office. I was also the Maryland State Dare Officer of the Year in 2014. Um, all things I'm, I'm very proud of throughout my career and, and got a perspective that a lot of police officers don't get to have where they're seeing positive relationships and positive outcomes every day. Uh, I'm particularly concerned with the language in this bill, which would cause the removal of SROs from all schools and school property in Maryland. For years, I, I did get to see firsthand the outstanding relationships that were formed between SROs and students, mentoring relationships, coaching relationships, and even helping kids who were struggling with home life or sometimes crime. I've heard some testimony earlier that, that, that really uh, discredits that. And, and this, I believe this legislation certainly devalues all the work that I and hundreds of SROs perform on a daily basis or have performed and would prevent future relationships from being built. Today, more than ever, we need to build strong community ties and partnerships and what better place to start than in the schools. It gives kids a chance to see police outside the badge and see that they are human. Countless times over my years in the schools, I had kids tell me that I changed their perception of police, that they would have never walked up to a police officer on the street or even in a restaurant, uh, but that they felt like they could talk to me in the school. From there, they would talk to me about their everyday life, sometimes good news, sometimes struggles. And I would like to think that this may have also helped them Better, with better relationships if they would encounter a police officer somewhere in their future. I think there is a misconception that SROs are only in the schools to make arrests. Truth is, most arrests that I was involved with in the schools were started through school administration, and I assisted after it was determined that police action may be necessary. 
And even in those cases, a very high percentage of those arrests were non-custodial arrests where the juvenile was released to the parent, the custody of a parent or, or guardian at the end. We also had first offender diversion programs and knowing the students helped us to better direct them into those programs uh, without them entering into the juvenile justice program whatsoever. I do agree that SROs should not be involved in school discipline issues and that school administrators should not be encouraging this behavior. This should be clearly spelled out in MOUs between police agencies and the schools. SROs are available to provide some, also available to provide first responder, responder medical care um, when, when needed, such as CPR. Sheriff Adams, we, uh, the three minute time limit has uh, come up. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll end with this, just saying realize if, if we remove school, the police from schools, we are not gonna necessarily remove the problems that they're there to help with. And I would ask for an unfavorable uh, committee report on this bill. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, any questions for Mr. Fraley, Boatwright, Pets, or uh, Sheriff Adams, uh, Deliet Lasanti. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do have a couple questions because, um, and I guess I'll start with my uh, question for Mr. Fraley. Um, and it, it has to do with um, data collection. You um, you made a comment about really that we collect data on the negative um, aspects, um, meaning the, the negative outcomes, really arrests and referrals in the ju juvenile justice system, but we really don't have a mechanism to collect data on the anecdotal um, experiences that we've heard. And throughout this, this testimony on this bill, we've heard anecdotal um, experiences on both sides. I come from a community where uh, school resources officers are very popular um, in the community and in the schools. So our experience has been very good. We heard testimony today to the contrary of that where other experiences have been, have been very bad. So how do, we, how do we go about creating a mechanism where we can collect that data of all of those insulary um, activities that, that are conducted by school resource officers in the, in the schools that are positive? Because we know that we know the negative piece. So how do how do we how do we collect the other side of the of the data? <laughs> that, that's that's a good question. Uh, it's a very good question, and and I'm not real sure how to handle to collect the positive stuff. But uh, it, it it is I would say that if we had somebody to to sit down and decide how to figure out to do that, we could. Uh, most of the data that I've I've seen that I've been collected uh, was uh, Mr. Officer Nittig was on here earlier saying he did the FOIA report. Uh, that's where most of the data that I have that is attached to my written uh, testimony that was submitted. Um, but it would be definitely something that we should look into to try to collect that data on the positive side, not the negative side. Right. Because I almost wonder that, I mean, even with the reports that the SROs do back to their respective departments, uh, the one young man that testified today um, and and, and I, I, I can't find my notes right now of w what jurisdiction he was from, it doesn't really matter. But he talked about getting in trouble, having, having a situation where he was preparing for a fight and, um, and he ended up um, interacting with the SRO and, and worked through this. And it was a really positive outcome and, and where it really could have gone really, really bad for this young man. Correct. I mean, I know that you all do uh, reports about the incidences and things like that. And I think we need to really think in the law enforcement community of how we write our reports and how we collect that information. Because I think, I, I think it's a very um, under reported a piece of this argument that, that we need to start collecting. So uh, I'll have all the, the professionals on the call to, to, to uh, think about that. So let me pivot a little bit to uh, Chief Boatwright and Sheriff Adams. Um, we, the state side of the school resource officers funding is about $10 million. Do you, either of you have an idea, because um, I, I haven't been able to collect this information about how, how much investment is is done by counties and municipalities in Maryland funding SRO programs themselves. So then we go to Lasanti to answer your question. Um, I can speak about Baltimore City and uh, okay. 
in that, uh, that work. Um, we are the only um, school police department um, in the state of Maryland, and our salaries are fully funded through the Baltimore City public school system and not the, the state F SRO system. What happens in other jurisdictions, the local police jurisdiction pays the salaries of the police officers, but they are either on loan or detailed or there's some sort of MOU or contract um, that allows those police officers to go into the schools and to provide that security service. So in Baltimore, we're unique, uh, unique in the fact that um, we are paid for by the Baltimore City Department of Education, um, where other jurisdictions pay for their police and their regular budget. Okay. And, and Delegate Lasanti, I would I would um, concur with that. It it it's unique to each individual jurisdiction, I believe. In, in Cecil County, I know that the SROs are paid for directly out of my budget, out of the Cecil County Sheriff's Office budget. We do not get funding from the schools. We do not get any kind of grants that that fund our SROs, it comes directly from my budget. I believe so would it be fair to say as, um, as local elected officials are reviewing your budgets, if it wasn't a, a publicly supported program, that it would be cut, that the funding for those programs would be cut? Is that a fair statement? I think it, could, it would certainly be discussed and it could be, but it's okay. correct. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, if, uh, if there's no other questions, I'll call up uh, the next group uh, of people. Uh, we next have, uh, there's I think four more unfavorable and then uh, one informational. We'll go to Betty Covington with the Baltimore City School Police Force. Yes, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, I wanna thank you all for this opportunity to sit in front of you today. I am in Baltimore City School Police. I have 20 years, 22 years on um, with the Baltimore City School, Pol School Police Force. I am the CEO and founder of a mentoring group called Girls Expecting More Success. Um, I wouldn't be sitting in front of you if I was, was not a school police because this way I found that Digital Harbor High School and Southern High School where girls was having great, it was really a whole lot of issues going on where, um, they were um, involved in gang activities. Um, they were drinking, they were fighting, they it was assault. Um, even some of my girls, well, two of my girls were actually murdered. And um, it just had me as a police officer, I'm like, we have to do more. We have to do more so kids want to do better. And so it was my vision that I brought to the school system. And Tisha, I was actually was the, um, chief of staff at that time. And I knew that I had to get people on board to work with me to make a difference um, at Digital Harbor High School. Um, and I told her, I said, listen, I have a vision. I wanna do some mentoring. We need to change. I need to change the way that I'm operating. The school system needs to change the way that they're doing things as well. Um, do you mind if I mentor? She said, absolutely, yes, you can. I said, I'm not concerned with the income, but I'm concerned with the outcome. Then I went to the principal of the school. I got a social worker. I got a counselor. I got teachers, a psychologist to work with me. And I was explaining to them that we have to do more for children so they can want to do better. I said, it's a lot going on down here. Arrest, arresting the kids is not the answer. Um, and I told them I did not have any income at the time, um, but they would be willing to get on board to, to make a difference with children. They said yes. So the, I started this program, this mentoring group in 2007, and I focused on ages from 10 to 18 years old. These were kids that was having challenges with overcoming family and personal drug and alcohol problems, teenage pregnancy, suicidal tendency, eating disorder, poor school performance, social skills, low self-esteem, issues around single parent and extended family and guardianships, unemployment and low income and very little support. So I just started meeting them and I was telling the teachers, well, can what I need you all to do, I need you to tutor these girls after school so they can, so they can graduate. We need them to graduate. I, we met in the circle time and I'm telling you, just by talking to these girls the way that I started out, listening to their issues, we were able to solve because these were girls who was getting thrown out the classroom 
And I told the teachers, I said, well, I would take them back to the room. And I said, listen, Ms. Ms. Not Covington, Ms. Covington, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Interrupt. You have a, a wrap up sentence, please. I sure do. Um, so the program has been a great access. I have a summer camp that I do every year for six weeks for free um, for young ladies, eight years okay, old. Ms. Covington, that's uh, that's going to have to be it. OK, thank you. Um, thank you. Let's wrap up. Everyone gets the same time. Uh, Mr. Willems, are you here? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Willems representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Um, I'm, uh, you know, breathing a sigh of relief uh, for, for once. It's not me alone at the end of the day hearing um, a long list of proponents. Um, and so I, I really want to stress uh, building on the testimony that you've just heard uh, from the officers and individuals involved uh, that this is not um, a, a um, an either or situation, it's really both and. And if, if I could go back to the request for more uh, evidence of the positive outcomes, that is something that we've been wrestling with uh, through a work group on uh, student arrest and student arrest data um, that's hosted by, by MABE. And there is a need for local school systems and the Maryland uh, State Department of Education. And I think that um, to some extent, uh, the Center for School Safety uh, professionals involved uh, in the training of SROs to gather data on the successes of the pre-arrest diversionary programs and the positive outcomes for students. Uh, there are post-arrest diversionary programs as well. And there is a role for the social workers, school psychologists, uh, counselors uh, that are envisioned not only in the other legislation that, that, uh, that, that is pending, uh, uh, Delegate uh, Wilkins bill that would eliminate the grants but still provide the discretion to provide the services. We're supporting uh, Delegate Washington's uh, bill uh, House Bill 522 to uh, ensure that the SROs are not involved in unilateral discipline decisions and can't be directed by the administrators to do so. And that's another piece here. The SROs are not actually in control of most of these arrest decisions. Um, parents, administrators, uh, um, th that's, that's where the arrests happen. And there's a role in the state's attorney's office as well uh, for actually uh, proceeding with the charges. So more people need to be involved, I think, in uh, accentuating the positive and where resources are need to build more positive outcomes for students, uh, to certainly uh, build on training to minimize the extent of the negative outcomes for students, which can arise from some of the bad practices, which I think uh, Delegate Washington's bill are, uh, are specifically uh, targeted at. And so we do strongly oppose this bill uh, because of its kind of draconian approach of eliminating the role of SROs or school police in Baltimore City, but we are not uh, in uh, we, are, we are not denying the fact that there is the need for continuous improvement here, and we have a lot of successes in working with MSDE uh, on 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 this data. But we need to we need to go deeper and broader, if you will, to understand uh, better what's actually happening and working. And I would say um, it's not inexpensive to provide a holistic approach that meets the needs of students before, during, and after uh, they are behaving in such a way that would, on the street, uh, response of, of a regular you know, law enforcement officer result in an arrest. And that is not what's happening in schools the vast majority of the time. And we do worry that if this bill passed, that would be more likely, not less likely to occur. So for those reasons, we urge an unfavorable report on this bill, but a favorable consideration of legislation uh, such as House Bill 522 and other efforts uh, to improve uh, this process on behalf of our students. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hardy. George. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are you, are you here? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Hello? Oh. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? We can hear you, okay, please go you. ahead. I apologize for that. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm here in opposition to House Bill uh, 1089. Um, my name is George Hardy. I'm the Director of Operations for the National Association of School Resource Officers. Um, I started off my um, as a career right out of college as a teacher. I was a teacher for eight years before moving to law enforcement where I served for 20 years as an SRO and SRO supervisor um, in public schools. NASRO is a nonprofit organization um, established to support school-based law enforcement officers. 
um, in their training. Not only do we support law enforcement officers, we also support school administrators and school safety and security personnel um, training in school safety so that we can help maintain safe learning environments for everyone. A call by some communities for reformation in law enforcement is um, likely necessary in some communities. However, NASRO attests that removal or restriction of carefully selected and specifically trained SROs from serving as safety partners in schools would increase the risk of violence and reduce the opportunity for law enforcement to build positive long-term relationships with students. The National Police Foundation's Averted School Violence Database includes situations in which SROs are, um, has intervened to prevent a violent act. Um, so there is some data that is being um, gathered on not only um, on things that don't make the news, we don't hear about on a day-to-day -day basis, but by the National um, Police Foundation's Averted School Violence Special Report uh, put out by the COPS office um, with the DOJ. Carefully, we wanna uh, really emphasize that carefully selected, specifically trained SROs provide positive benefits, uh, positive relationships, prevention of on-campus violence, mitigation of unpreventable violence, which we've heard mentioned in other testimonies, and reduction of students entering juvenile justice system. And I emphasize, we are there to reduce that juvenile justice system um, coming into the lives of students in our schools, because we understand that making an arrest in our school, in a public school, does not solve the situation. Um, those students are gonna come back to us with those same problems and maybe more. So we need to look into it. We, we train SROs um, on mental health issues. Um, we train SROs on understanding the adolescent brain development and how trauma affects that development. We want um, SROs to be trained in understanding implicit bias. Um, we want them to be experts on de-escalation. Um, we want them to understand special education and special education laws in the schools, recognizing mental illness and responding appropriately to those students that may have issues with mental illness. I heard the sheriff mention that an MOU is imperative and all parties involved have a clear understanding of the duties of their role as an administrator, teacher. Mr. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Hardy, we, uh, your three minutes of, uh, are up. Okay, thank you. And if I, I heard Ms. Uh, Delegate Lasanti mention about the um, good things that happen, a lot of school systems or a lot of police departments and sheriff's departments are um, have daily activity logs that log those. We just have to figure out a way to get them into a national database so we can collect that. Okay. Just, you, all right, thank you, thank you. Um, we have Catherine Goodwin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Major Katie Goodwin of the Anne Arundel County Police Department. On behalf of my agency and the Maryland Chiefs of Police Association and Maryland Sheriff's Association, I am offering testimony in opposition of House Bill 1089. Being an SRO is not about arresting students. It's about building relationships and allowing youths to see police officers in a different light. Before SROs, a child's only experience with an officer may have been watching a family member or friend be arrested in their community. The enforcement of laws is only a very small role of an SRO, and yet that's what we hear talked about the most. So let's talk about the larger roles an SRO plays in a child's life. SROs are informal counselors by building relationships, reinforcing positive behaviors, and connecting youth with needed services. SROs are educators and coaches. They teach topics in the classroom related to law enforcement and character development. Some of ours even coach for the school's basketball and wrestling teams. SROs are emergency managers. They're responsible for developing and implementing safety plans. Let us not forget that they are there to protect these precious lives if that bad day were to ever happen. As a reminder, officers must attend 40 hours of additional training just to become an SRO. And I'm proud to say that one of our SROs helped develop the state training program. Topics that include informal counseling, youth development, de-escalation, restorative practices, maintaining a positive school climate, and implicit bias, and that's just to name a few. We also have a very effective diversion program in our county. In the 2018-19 school year, we diverted over 531 juveniles to one of our programs and over 90% of them did not reoffend. That's a success story. If you don't believe me, talk to our students. I could sit here and tell you countless success stories on how our SROs positively impact the life of a student. One SRO says it best. He doesn't want that first time he comes into contact with a student to be on their worst day. Building rapport takes time. 
which is why those daily interactions an SRO has with the student is so important. Police departments build trust by establishing relationships at an early age. That is the primary role of an SRO, and I cannot be more proud of these special officers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then the last person in opposition, Tim Cameron. He's not here. All right, thank you. He's not here. Are there any, sorry, are there any questions for this last group of uh, witnesses opposing the bill? Um, Ms. Covington, Mr. Willems, and Mr. Hardy, and I'm sorry, and Ms. Goodwin, any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, if not, um, Tanisha Smith is here informational. I don't know if there was, uh, if she was planning to testify or not. You're signed up. Is she here? All right. Uh, uh, to members, uh, we are done with the hearing on House Bill 1089 and done for the hearing for the day. Uh, to uh, uh, one or two people who are signed on and still in the Zoom that may have been here for earlier bills, those were done uh, uh, before 3.30. So uh, we're well past those bills. Are there any announcements from any of the uh, subcommittee chairs? Delegate Patterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a reminder is that the um, Racing and Gaming Subcommittee will return or reconvene at 6.30. Um, to go over the remainder of, of House Bill 940 and have a voting session on amendments. All right, uh, thank you. And who's next? Who else is here? Delegate Ebersole. Kudos to the Early Childhood Committee for doing some good work today. All right, uh, anybody else? Uh, uh, Delegate Wilkins. No announcements from the election laws. All right, great. Um, anything else for the uh, for the good of the order? Okay, now 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 my wife will bring over the upside down baby. <laughs> there she is. Whoop! She's not on the screen yet. Anyway, oh, yeah. she was already on. Times she's making a lot of noise. She's been typing on my keyboard. She seemed to like when I moved people on the Zoom checkerboard and moved you around from spot to spot. Mr. Barry, good to see you again. Uh, if there's nothing else from everyone, we will uh, ask everyone to uh, ask them to stop the YouTube and then we will say goodbye and see y'all tomorrow for the hearing. <laughs>